first start with Maria Pira from the Spanish National Resource Council. We'll talk about ab initio modeling of molecular motions and the confinement. Thank you very much for the introduction. First of all, I would like uh, to thank the organizer for having invited me to such an uh, special and interesting meeting. Here, I will present uh, our work on ab initio modeling of molecular motion and their confinement in two different scenarios. This work was developed in collaboration with uh, Andrea Hauser from the Grassi University of Technology and Alexander Mitrushenko from the Université Paris of Malavale. <coughs> the first scenario is a liquid helon droplet at very low temperature, 0.4 Kelvin. Here we see the helon droplet uh, represented with a blue circle. As many of you know, at this very low temperature, helium is not a normal fluid. It is superfluid. And uh, our fundamental question addressed is if the superfluid phase existing in the droplet is a possible liquid medium for probing a long-range electron transfer or harpoon-type reaction between two molecules, in particular from uh, from a fullerene molecule that uh, is known to reside inside the droplet, as we can see here, and uh, atomic scission or the scission dimer, which are uh, hylophobic uh, species known to reside uh, at, the, at the surface of the droplet instead. And this fundamental question arises because two antagonistic effects play an important role. On one hand, uh, the reactant species are expected to move through the superfluid below the so-called critical Landau velocity due to frictional energy loss at higher speed. In fact, the best known property of uh, superfluid helium is the vanishing viscosity that uh, objects experience while moving below this uh, critical velocity. And uh, the key point is that uh, the low value of this velocity, about uh, 60 meters per second, favors an electron hopping process. However, the extrusion of helium upon the approach of the two reactant species is expected to add an energetic barrier to the reaction. And this is so because the natural location of a hylophobic species such as the scission dimer is at the surface of the drop. Therefore, we have two antagonistic effects. And to answer this question, we combine ab initio modeling characterizing the molecular interaction in gas phase with a new concept of solvation corrected reaction pathway. <clears throat> Actually, our work was motivated by a very recent experiment based uh, on electron ionization mass spectroscopy in the group of Paul Scheyer at Eastbrook. The experiment indicated that uh, this reaction between the cesium dimer and the fullerene molecule takes place inside the droplet. However, it doesn't take place for atomic cesium. This was interpreted uh, as an indirect confirmation of the harpoon type reaction. Thus, as we can see here, the hopping of an electron at long range would lead uh, to cationic scission and anionic fullerene species. The charred fragments experience a very strong Coulomb interaction, leading to the formation of a strong scission 2 fullerene molecule. However, it doesn't explain why the reaction doesn't explain for atomic scission. To explain the experimental outcome, we first calculated uh, the gas phase interaction potential between the reactant species. To this end, a standard electronic basis set was employed. And the interaction energy were calculated uh, at MP2 level of theory and using also a diabetic representation of the hartree focket function to calculate the electronic couplings. Here we see a picture of the cesium dimer in a T-shaped configuration with respect to the fullerene molecule, which is uh, the most probable configuration in the experimental pickup process. There are two relevant electronic states. 
in the excited state shown here with a red line, the two interacting species conserve their neutral character, becoming bound by van der Waal dispersion forces. The ionic state shown here with a green line is the ground state at the equilibrium distance, and it is characterized by very strong cooler interaction between anionic fullerene and cationic cesium species. Uh, as regards the experimental question about why the reaction doesn't explain for atomic cesium, it is first very interesting to compare the potential energy curve for atomic cesium in the upper graph and the cesium dimer in the lower graph. The cesium dimer approaching the fullerene molecule in a collinear configuration. Uh, at, the, at the potential minima, the energy landscape doesn't differ too much, although the interaction is obviously stronger for the cesium dimer. In fact, the interesting difference is found at the crossing region, because as we can see here, it uh, shows up at uh, a much larger distance for the cesium dimer. And this is due to the fact that the ionization energy for the cesium dimer is about uh, 4,000 weight numbers smaller, allowing for an earlier crossing. Therefore, here we have a hint uh, to explain the, the experiment. As a second ingredient, we introduced the landau Center model to estimate electron hopping probabilities as a function of the velocity of the reactant species. Once again, it is important to stress that the reactant species are expected to, to move below the critical Landau velocity. And uh, the low value of this velocity, about uh, 60 meters per second, favors the electron hopping process because more time the reactant species can spend in the crossing region. Accordingly, as we can see in this picture, the electron hopping probabilities are very significant at the critical Landau velocity, about 50% uh, uh, for atomic cesium and also the cesium dimer in an orientational average. As a third ingredient, we introduced helium density functional theory to account for the presence of the helium droplet, that is, to quantify the repulsive energy contribution from the extrusion of helium upon the approach of the two reactant species. This is a very interesting example of how density functional theory can be applied not only in electronic structure but also to describe nuclear motion. Very briefly, by applying the helium density functional approach, the helium droplet is first described as a condensate with all helium atoms occupying the same orbital. Then we map uh, the density into the energy, which is written in terms of the quantum kinetic energy and the uncertainty of functional of the helium density. Along with the common term from the mean field helium helium interaction, this functional contains two very important terms accounting for short range correlation from the helium atom. And then we minimize the free energy of the droplet. The free energy of the droplet as a function of the distance between the reactant species. Of course, the free energy contains a term introducing the interaction of helium with the two reactant species. And with zero energy set at infinite distance between the reactant species, here we have uh, the energetic barrier for the entrance of cesium or cesium-2 into the droplet. And we can see that the energy barriers are very high, especially for the <coughs> cesium dimer in a T-shaped configuration. Actually, these energetic barriers are rather high as compared with the interaction energies at the crossing region of a few weight numbers, but not as compared with uh, the very attractive interaction in the ionic state uh, of about 15,000 weight numbers. Finally, we add uh, these energetic barriers to the gas phase interaction energies so that solvation corrected energy pathway are obtained in a diabetic representation. Once again, it is important to take into account that the reactant species move below a maximum kinetic energy determined by the critical Landau velocity. Here in the color squares, 
you have uh, the values of the maximum kinetic energy along with the total energy at the crossing region. And you can see uh, with uh, a square colored in green and a happy face that uh, the, the maximum kinetic energy is larger than the total energy for the cesium dimer in a collinear configuration, but not for atomic cesium, nor for the cesium dimer at the TGF approach. Therefore, it is predicted that, that the Harpoon type reaction takes place for the cesium dimer, but not for atomic cesium. And this is due to the fact that uh, the earlier crossing of the cesium dimer allows for, for a smaller value of the repulsive energy contribution arising from the presence of the Heron droplet. And it is also very interesting to see that the energetic barrier due to the presence of the Heron droplet quench the stabilization of Van der Waal compresses, indicating that the experimental signal arises from a direct Harpoon type process without involving an intermediate Van der Waal state uh, and subsequent uh, electronic relaxation. To sum up, our Avinicio study clearly shows the occurrence of a Harpoon type reaction inside superfluid helium, nightly confirming the experiment. And more generally, it can be seen as an evidence that molecular motion under confinement in the superfluid medium occurs below the critical and velocity. Now I will talk about uh, confinement of molecular motion in a different scenario, the insight of carbon nanotube. The first question we might ask is why this scenario is interesting. Well, on one hand, it is well known that uh, carbon nanostructure are relevant materials for applications such as uh, gas absorption, selective separation of light isotopes, nanoreactivity, and also hydrogen storage. In fact, uh, the general goal in hydrogen storage methods is to pack uh, hydrogen molecules as close as possible. Existing evidences for solid-like packing in carbon-based uh, nanoporous materials. But uh, on the other hand, the role of quantum nuclear effects in the motion of molecules under confinement in carbon nanotube is truly fundamental, especially when dealing with light species at low temperature. Actually, the subject caught our attention through a recent experimental work uh, published by OBA. Low temperature experimental measurement of OBA revealed a quantity absorption of helium in carbon nanopores with diameter below one nanometer. And interestingly, the work also showed that more molecules of nitrogen than helium atoms absorb in these narrow nanopores, and despite of the larger kinetic diameter of molecular nitrogen. To model this system, let us infer how we had modeled the Van der Waal interaction between one helium atom or one molecule of nitrogen with carbon nanotube. For this purpose, we have considered a short nanotube with diameter below one nanometer and applied the well-known sub-DFT approach. Here, uh, represented uh, with uh, blue lines, you can see the total interaction energies and, uh, and also the, the other contribution, chain repulsion, dispersion, induction. And uh, we first noticed that the potential minima are located uh, at the nanotube center because they are the absorbed benefits from the dispersion interaction with carbon atoms at both sides of the nanotube. Uh, however, upon increasing the nanotube diameter, the dispersion becomes very small at the nanotube center so that all potential minima shift toward the carbon cage, as we can see here. <coughs> Okay. Uh, to consider wider and longer nanotube, we have uh, proposed an additive pairwise potential model working very well for the interaction of atoms and molecules with car carbon materials. Our potential model uses the partition of the Van der Waal interaction into dispersion and dispersionless contribution. For the dispersionless interaction, the model account for the typical exponential growth 
as the absorbed surface distance increases, caution by a Gaussian. And for the dispersion, we had the typical C6-C8 expansion with the damping function of tan and tunis. However, uh, we had also found that uh, to model the absorption on carb uh, carbon materials is also very important to introduce an isotropy terms making the interaction different uh, depending on the relative location of the absorbed, for example, on top of one carbon atom or at the hollow site. And here we can see that our model interaction energy represented uh, with blue lines closely follow the ability to interaction energy represented with blue circles. Let us see now how we have deal with the nuclear motion problem. In order to understand the experiment of OBA, our first idea was uh, to immerse carbon nanotubes of different sizes in a large helon droplet uh, composed by 2,000 helon atoms and applying the helon density functional approach. The work showed a manifested quantum behavior in the helon motion, including a very interesting dependency of the helon density layering on the nanotube diameter and the formation of cavities with zero density. And this can be seen here where we have represented the helium densities as a function of the radial distance from the helium atom to the nanotube center. And moreover, by averaging the helium density flooding into the immersed nanotube, a small helium cleaning factor were calculated for nanotube with diameter below one nanometer in full agreement with the experiment of OBA. In this follow-up study, we consider both helium and molecular nitrogen clusters in nanotube with diameter below and above one nanometer because, as you remember, the experiment of OBA includes also uh, molecules of nitrogen. Uh, for this purpose, we applied uh, a nuclear wet function based method instead. Uh, here we have the total Hamiltonian written in cylindric coordinates as a sum of one particle kinetic energy terms, an additive pairwise absorbent nanotube and absorbent absorbent interaction. And uh, separating the global rotation and the collective motion are, uh, along the tube axis. Here we have the expression of the wet function for two absorbed molecules, where lambda is the projection of the angular momentum onto the nanotube axis, and it is conserved. Here we have the Hamiltonian for each lambda value. And our Hamiltonian problem is solved by using the discrete variable representation approach by solving the nuclear Schrodinger equation in the real space. Let us first consider the helium and molecular nitrogen dimers inside a nanotube with diameter below one nanometer. Here, capital N denotes the, num the number of uh, helium atoms, and we can see that one particle density as a function of the radial distance from the absorber to the nanotube center are the same for one and two helium atoms, and the same holds true for a larger uh, number of helium atoms or nanotube size, so this result is general. Uh, the bosonic helium atom occupying the same nuclear orbital as a function of the radial distance, and the total energy can be written as n times the energy of the nuclear orbital plus a small term accounting for a weak helon uh, helon attraction along the perpendicular direction, along the long axis of the narrow nanotube. And this contribution can be estimated from a very simple one dimensional model for the effective absorbed, absorbed interaction along the nanotube uh, axis using the average radial distance. For narrow nanotube, the average uh, radial distance is, is obviously very small, and so this term accounting for angular dependencies, and as a result, the effective interaction along the tube axis differs very, very little from the interaction of isolated absorbed molecules without uh, having the carbon nanotube. Therefore, we can say that there is an extreme one-dimensional confinement of helium and molecular nitrogen cluster along the axis of a narrow nanotube with the carbon cage 
modify very little the pure asorbate asorbate interaction, and then, for example, the wet function of the isolated uh, dimers along the axis of the narrow nanotube, of course, in the perpendicular direction, we had confinement still. On the other hand, it is well known that the helon dimer wet function represented here with a grid line is very broad because we have an extremely large zero point motion. Uh, the, I mean, the average is 50 astron, and in contrast, uh, the average uh, of position for the center of mass of uh, two molecules of nitrogen is about four astron. Therefore, we can, understood, we can understand why, uh, according to the experiment of OVA, more molecules of nitrogen and kilonaton absorb in a given nanotube length because the extremely large zero point motion for the, for, uh, for the helium clusters. Okay, so once that uh, we have explained the experiment of OPA, let us now increase the diameter of the nanotube. Here we have very interesting result because uh, here I have represented the PR density distribution as a function of the kilon kilon distance. And uh, you can see that the distribution colored in red uh, and green are more localized in the wider nanotube than in the narrow nanotube represented with a blue line. Remember that here we have essentially the wet function of the isolated helium diamond. Uh, in wider nanotube, there is one peak with the position determined by the helium nanotube interaction and the hard core of the helium helium interaction, but also a very important secondary energy peak entering into the minimum region of the helium helium potential and then determined by the helium helium attraction. It's very important because this peak is directly related with this other peak in the pair correlation function of bulk superfluid liquid helium. So it is surprising that with just two or three kilonatoms, we start to have profiles resembling those of bulk liquid helium. And uh, all these features are signaling the transition from one to two dimensional confinement upon increasing the nanotube diameter. Helium in narrow nanotube behave as a gas, but confined in one direction. In the two dimensional confinement, however, helium behave as a liquid. As a liquid in a toroidal share around the nanotube uh, axis and as expected from the helium nanotube interaction shifted toward the carbon cage. Now I would like uh, to come back to the fundamental reasons for the nanotube diameter dependency of the helium density layering. For this purpose, I had represented here the helium densities along with the helium nanotube interaction potential for three different uh, nanotube sizes. In red, we have uh, an narrow nanotube uh, with a diameter below one nanometer, and uh, in blue and green, uh, we have a uh, wider nanotube. You can see that the peaks of the helium densities are clearly located about the potential minimum. Moreover, upon increasing the nanotube diameter beyond one nanometer, we can see the formation of an extra layer at the nanotube center, we can see it in this two-dimensional contour product and also here. And it turns out that the radial distance between the central and the lateral layer is about uh, the position of the potential minimum for the helon helon interaction. This way, the, hel the layering of helion is such that uh, the helion nanotube attractive interaction is optimized avoiding the hardcore of the helium helium potential in narrow nanotube, but uh, taking advantage of the helium helium potential minima in uh, wider nanotube so that uh, we have uh, the transition from uh, a gas in one direction, one dimensional confinement, to a liquid uh, in, uh, in two dimensional confinement. Uh, 
Um, okay, uh, we have also developed uh, an embedding approach in which uh, a part of the helon density, in this case the central layer, is described using the nuclear wave function treatment, while the other layers are accounted for through the helon density functional formulation. I mean, this is just a chief of the embedding theory developed in electronic structure, nothing more than this. And uh, here we have the expression of the embedding potential. Actually, there are more terms, but this is uh, the more important one. And, uh, and it is uh, very interesting to see here that uh, the addition of an embedding potential to the helium nanotube interaction gives rise to a chief of the potential minima from the carbon cage, for, from the lateral region of the, of the nanotube to the center of the nanotube. And the same holds true for the nuclear wave function. Therefore, uh, I mean, the formation of the central layer was a result uh, from uh, helon density functional formulation. And uh, we wanted uh, to show that uh, this can be confirmed through this embedding scheme. And actually, with this embedding scheme, we are confirming the formation of this uh, central layer. And, uh, and very recently, oh, OK. Uh, OK. I, I will take to the conclusion of this part uh, of, of uh, the work. Uh, well, uh, our work has illustrated uh, the key role of quantum nuclear effects for molecular motion inside carbon nanotube. Also, how helium density functional and wet function treatment can be complementary to each other, and how the absorbent nanotube interaction problem can be undertaken by combining the ab initio sub treatment with uh, physically motivated uh, pair wave potential models. And, uh, okay. and very recently, we have uh, extended uh, all this uh, methodological protocol to the study of uh, molecular deuterium clusters inside uh, carbon nanotube. And uh, we had found, for the first time, an ab initio evidence of hexagonal close packing, which can be seen here. And this is in line with uh, still unpublished uh, neutron uh, based uh, experimental measurement. And, uh, and so this is, uh, this is very interesting because. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the cross packing of uh, molecular nitrogen is, is, uh, is one of the goal in hydrogen storage uh, uh, methods. And, uh, okay, before closing, I would like uh, to thank the funding from this Spanish grant from the Agencia Estatal de Investigación in Spain. Very especially, I would like uh, to, to acknowledge the great support of the European Cause Action Molecules in Motion, MOLIN, and also uh, my collaborators, Alexander Mitrushenko and Andrea Hauser, uh, uh, because of uh, this collaboration has been uh, really great. And okay, and uh, I, I, I would also like uh, to announce uh, a meeting that uh, we are organizing within the framework of the European Cause Action Molecules in Motion. This meeting is uh, focused on multi-scale modeling from quantum effects to material properties at the nanoscale. And uh, this meeting, it will be at the Grass University of Technology in February. And uh, if someone in the audience is interested in being a speaker in this meeting, so please let me, let me know. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your time, for your attention, and congratulations to the organizer for the perfect organization of this meeting. Thank you.
Okay, so we have time so for some quick questions. Yeah. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, I did not understand one point. Uh, uh, when you are talking of the interaction of uh, the helium dimer, hmm. because the helium dimer is not bound. I mean the two helium... The, uh, the, uh, well, uh, and so it is strange that this dimer is interacting with something. Well, the helium dimer is bound. I mean, well, for, the, for, for the, the helium uh, four. I mean, four helium is bound. I mean, the dimer. The helium dimer. Uh -huh. I, I knew that the uh, distance uh, should be uh, something like 7,000 uh, astrons. Yeah, 50 astrons. Hmm. And, uh, and so this is, uh, this is the reason why in the experiment uh, they see just uh, a few atoms of helium and uh, much more molecular nitrogen. Because, uh, I mean... Uh, I mean, got, the yes. dimer of nitrogen, okay, is bound, but the dimer of helium in my... Uh... It's bound. I mean, the, 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 the energy is negative. I mean, it's, uh, it's not bound for the helium-3 isotope. But uh, for the helium-4 isotope, uh, the dimer is, uh, is bound. Uh, I don't know, the energy is something <laughs> like... Uh, well, it can be it is different inside a nanotube. But uh, I think that in the gas phase, uh, practically there are only scattering evidences, but the dimer, in my opinion, has not been uh, isolated. And the average distance will be 7,000 Armstrong. <laughs> Very far away. But Okay, okay. Well, uh, I mean, what I, uh, as, far, as far as I know, I mean, the, the average for the helium dimer is 50 astron. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so let's thank our speaker. And the next speaker <laughs> is Luca Muccioli from the University of Bologna will talk about modeling of the electromechanical response of rubrin single crystals. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for being here also today. And uh, I would like to start also thanking the organizers for this opportunity of presenting the work that which has been done actually at the University of Bordeaux. Does it work? Mm -hmm. Yes. I spent the last two years at the University of Bordeaux, and so this, this work actually I've been carrying in Bordeaux, even if now I'm in Bologna. And I would like to start thanking the people that which actually did the work, in particular Marco Pereira, who did the experiments, and uh, Michaela and Manoj, who, who performed the, the calculations. So I will be talking about organic electronics. And uh, you know that everybody talks about organic electronics, uh, talking about flexible devices. And it's easy to understand that <clears throat> when you have a flexible device, it will be subjected to many types of deformation. But uh, a little is known about the relationship between the electromechanical properties, well, from the mechanical properties and the response, uh, the electric response in the, these devices. And uh, you can understand if you want a flexible device, you can have a, a pressure sensor or a mechanical sensor, and so you want that the, the current changes upon the stress, or you can want something to be stable. So. You want that your device is working even if you bend it. And so the, my talk will be about uh, this um, question. So how much uh, is stable rubrin to mechanical stress? And um, what are the relevant parameters? And we, which is the simplest picture in, um, to understand the relationship between mobility and stress? So the main parameter governing mobility is the electronic coupling between the, 
the initial and final states, or let's say within the molecule, the two molecules that exchange the charge. And uh, this coupling uh, then uh, goes into the rate equations. There are many rate equations, but uh, you see, for instance, here is the Marcus equation. You see that the couplings appear squared in front of the rate. And uh, after you know the rates, you can compute the mobility, which is uh, actually the velocity of the charges divided by the electric field. So it's a measure of the intrinsic velocity of the charges in, inside the semiconductor. And uh, as the, it's well known that the electronic coupling decreases as the, the overlap between your orbitals when you increase the intermolecular distance. So you can expect that when you compress your material, you will have an increase on, of coupling and then an increase of mobility. And when you instead expand your material, you will expect a decrease of mobility. And uh, this is uh, summarized, but this is uh, a standard equation that is used for fitting mobili experimental mobility uh, trends. And you, you see that the, you expect the ratio between the mobilities depends on the strain that you apply. And uh, the parameter M depends on your material. And uh, most often for organics, a negative coefficient is obtained. So corresponding to the picture I showed you before, so negative means that when you expand, the mobility decreases. And actually, it has been, uh, for some material, it has been recognized. For instance, this is tips pentacin, and you see that uh, as you increase the distance, the mobility decreases. And when you, the overlap is very strong, so when the molecules are very close, the mobility is very high. So we will study this effect on rubrin by a combination of experimental measurements and uh, of molecular dynamic simulations, and then we we'll use the molecular dynamic simulation to compute the mechanical properties and to compute the geometries uh, on which we will perform uh, quantum chemistry calculations. So what is nice about rubrin is nice because it forms, it forms very uh, neat uh, single crystals. And uh, from the shape of the sig single crystals, as you see here, you can recognize the alignment of the three crystal axes. So you can perform measurements along the specific crystal axis you are interested in. And uh, when you do this, you, you see that the, the mobility is quite anisotropic, so it changes a lot from one crystal, to an, uh, one crystal direction to another, and also it's very high, so it's good for measurements. We are talking about mechanical properties, so elasticity is uh, the, the, the keyword. So we, you know, you can have two types of stress, normal stress and uh, shear stress, and if you take into account all of them, you have a lot of constants, but uh, in our case, we will focus only on normal stress, so we just focus on this part of the, of the matrix. So we'll have five coefficients <laughs> relating the strain to the stress. And which, which order of magnitude of coefficient we can expect. So you see for a, a metal, you have something like hundreds of uh, gigapascal, and for a plastic, you have two, and uh, for a brain, what we measured is about the order of magnitude is 10, so it's something between the, the rubber and uh, no, the plastic and the bone, so it's, it's more rigid than a standard plastic. Of course, it's not a plastic material. It's just organic. And uh, here in this table is just to show you that the, the value we obtain for young moduli and uh, Poisson ratios are in line with the other predictions and with the experimental values. So that means that the force we, we use in the simulation is, is okay. And what we do in the simulation, we start with a supercell with 256 molecules and we Actually, we do not apply the stress, but we rescale the distances and the shape of the box along the direction we want, and we measure the stress. So we apply a strain, we impose a strain, and we measure a stress. And we do that in two different ways. So two different kinds of simulations. Some simulations, we change only one axis of the, the box, so we can measure the, the stiffness tensor, and uh, you see the, the strain is zero along the other two directions, and we do also the opposite. So we 
impose a strain in a way that we have a stress only in one direction. And these two cases correspond to two limiting cases you can find in experiments. So we may be able to apply a strain without deforming the other two directions, or you can deform the other two directions according to the Poisson ratios. So this is the <coughs> now let's see what, what happens in our material. Of course, the intermolecular distances change. And this is just to show you that uh, they change as you expect. So if you change only one direction of the, of the box, you have uh, only one direction that changes in intermolecular distances. Here, actually, we distinguish the three main dimers of benzene. We'll come back to, to that later. And if you instead change, so you are in, in actual stress conditions, you change the three axes of the box, all the intermolecular distance change, but you may notice that in all the cases, the changes are really small. We are talking about very, very small efforts. So something like uh, 100 of angstroms. So let's see, then uh, here you have the dimers. So we calculate uh, from the simulated structure, we extract all the dimers and calculate the electronic couplings between them. And in rubrin, uh, there are three types of dimers, which correspond to the three crystal axes and to the three va different values of mobility. So in the, along the A-axis, there is pi stacking. So you see the coupling is quite sizable, about 100 millev. And in the same plane, but in the other direction here, is about 10 millev. And out of plane is uh, quite low, is just 1 millev. And we'll focus only on these two directions in this talk. So here we have an example of how these transfer integrals, so the electronic couplings, behave. So on the left we have in the axial strains and on the right on the axial stress. And we are measuring the coupling along the A direction. And we apply the strain along the three different directions of the crystal. And you may notice that, uh, so what to, with respect to the simple picture I presented before, you can expect that the slope is negative and is negative only along the same direction. So only the green curve should be like that, all the others should be horizontal. And you see that which is not the case and also there is a stronger uh, effect both if you deform the A and the B direction of the crystal along the couplings along A. And this is the same with the uniaxial stress but it's even more strange, let's see. And you see that there are negative slopes, so this means that mobility should, uh, positive slope, sorry, so this line means that mobility should increase if you compress the material along that direction. And uh, so this was the coupling along A, and more or less the same happens with the coupling along B. You see here, uniaxial strain, you have all positive, uh, negative slopes, but here you have negative slopes. So this tells you also that the mobility you measure depends on the mechanical boundary condition. Let's say. And uh, we also measured the mobilities. So how, how did we do? The crystal was put on, on a cantilever, and then the cantilever was slightly bent with a robot. And then you take a picture, and you measure the deflection, and from the deflection you can measure the strain. And the crystal is here at the very uh, left. If you do this, you are able to measure the current as a function of, uh, of the, the time and of the strain you apply. And you see it's quite reversible. And, uh, and the current is proportional to the mobility. So we can compare the, the measured current with the calculated mobility. Actually, we don't calculate not even the mobility, but we it is known, I mean, you see that the mobility depends on the diffusion coefficient, and the diffusion coefficient depends on the rates where the electronic coupling enters and on the intermolecular distance, Rj. So we use the intermolecular distances, which we calculated from the simulation and the electronic coupling, to compute something which is proportional to the diffusion coefficient. And then from the diffusion coefficient, you can say that the mobility is proportional to the J to some exponent. 
And this exponent depends on the transport model, but it ranges more or less from one to two. So in the next uh, slide, I will show you the mobility for Q equal one and Q equal two to encompass more or less all the transport models. And then we, okay, of course, we, we will plot the difference between the zero strain and the strained uh, experiment. So on the top you have the uh, calculated values and on the bottom the experimental values. And in this case we measure the, the coupling, no sorry, the mobility is measured along two different directions, you see. Uh, no, it's the same direction, sorry. So the strain is a, apply along two different directions, and the mobility is measured along the same direction. So as we saw already from the transfer integral, you may see that even if you apply the, in this case, you apply the strain along this direction, and you measure the mobility along the perpendicular direction, but mobility changes as well. And this is what also the simulation predicts, in particular, we, the experiment corresponds to the uniaxial strain case, so the, the blue curves, and you see that the, the agreement is quite good, in particular with Q equal two, so for the hopping-like uh, char transport model. And this is the same for the, the mobility along the, the other in-plane direction, the one with the smaller coupling, and you see again that uh, uh, there is a quite nice agreement with the simulation and experiments, and also that, um, again, mobility changes along direction perpendicular to the one in which the, the strain is applied. So before concluding, I would like to say that <coughs> this one, you know, normally computational chemistry are blamed that they, they know already the experimental results so they can obtain the experimental value. But in this case, we did the opposite. So the blame maybe will go to the experimentalists. And so what, what did we learn from this apart to the, the agreement with the experiment? We learned that um, there is a strong coupling between the two in plane direction A and B in Rubrin. So if you deform one direction, mobility changes also along the other. And um, more in general, that um, com with, with the comparison between uniaxial strain and uniaxial stress conditions, we saw that the, the effect of strain depends very much on how, on how much the strain is distributed in your system. So you must be careful in interpreting experimental measurements if you don't know exactly how the strain is distributed in your system. And uh, nothing, it's done. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. <laughs> So thank you. So we have time for a very short question. Um, thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, uh, I'm not into flexible e electronics, but when I think about flexibility, I rather think about bending rather than uh, you know, expansion. Uh, so, yes. so, I mean, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about a macroscopic lens scale. So, so yes, bending is more complicated because you have a, you bend like this, you have a, a positive strain on the, on the yeah. bottom and a negative strain on the top. So you have to, so, yes, you have, it's more complicated to, to study. Actually, we started with a, such an experiment and, um, but all, all the mechanisms are in play. So we start yeah, yeah. just from the simplest one. <laughs> but uh, I agree with you. Jean, just very short. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. So I'm just wondering if you consider only the elastic deformation or also the plastic deformation? No, it's only, uh, I didn't talk about that. But if you see the, the value of the strains is just a few, a zero, zero two percent. Ah, okay, okay. So it's in the elastic regime. The elastic. I think for rubrin, which is quite rigid, the, the plastic, or, or say not, not elastic, yeah, starts yeah. at about 0 0.5 percent. Okay, okay, thank for you. For other materials with alkyl chain is two percent.
That's good. Thank you. So let us thank again our speaker. So the next speaker is Jacopo Fregoni from the University of Modena and Reggio Emilia. We'll talk about non diabetic dynamics on hybrid light matter states. Good morning, everyone. I thank uh, the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present you what I've been doing during my first year of PhD. And uh, the work uh, is about uh, non adiabatic dynamics uh, under the strong coupling regime. The work is conducted under the supervision of uh, Professor Stefano Corni and in collaboration with the University of Pisa in particular uh, Giovanni Granucci and Maurizio Persico. So. Just a brief introduction on what uh, strong coupling is. It is the coherent energy exchange between uh, light and matter in uh, confined systems. So if we place a two-level quantum emitter inside, uh, sorry, inside uh, an optical cavity or a nano cavity and in any case uh, a resonant cavity, let's say, we can achieve the strong coupling regime if the um, exchange rate of energy between the light uh, and the matter is higher than any decay rate uh, of, the, uh, of the system. So we have two decay channels, one is for the emitter, one is the exit of the photon from the cavity. The um, system we want to simulate is a bit more complex than a two-level quantum emitter. In fact, we want to simulate a real molecule. And so we need to take into account we don't have just two states and uh, we don't have a, a really simple coupling. So our goal is to investigate how the hybrid light matter states are formed in the case of the molecules and to study the effect on the photochemistry of this kind of coupling. So, from the experimental point of view, there have been few works uh, about the strong coupling, and uh, it has been proven it, by the Epson group uh, that uh, it can influence the photochemistry of reactions in the case of this uh, photoisomerization of spiropyran and merocyanin. Then, uh, later on, uh, Baumberg's group uh, has shown that, single, uh, that uh, strong coupling is achievable for a single molecule at room temperature by engineering a system with a gold nanoparticle, a gold film, and a dye molecule trapped between them in, by using an organic molecule cage. This gave start to a lot of theoretical modeling by the group of uh, Mukamel, by the group of Rubio, and the group of Garcia Vidal, that have started to study how the um, strong coupling can affect the photochemistry. The latter group has forged, let's say, the term polaritonic chemistry. That is, what's the effect of uh, the, on the photochemistry given by the strong coupling regime, or in other words, let's study the photochemistry on polaritonic states. Okay. So, uh, the system I'm studying is the azobenzene molecule, which is well known. It's a benchmark system for photochemical systems. Usually, it is, uh, the photoisomerization of azobenzene is addressed uh, on one torsional coordinate, which is a torsion of the CNNC dihedral. 
but the system is a bit more involved, so we need to consider at least another, another coordinate, which is the opening of the NNC angle. The photoisomerization occurs through an hybrid mechanism driven by the torsion of the dihedral, but still uh, it has a component, let's say, on the opening of the NNC angle. I've computed the pass uh, on, of the bare molecule, so no light effect until now. Now let's see how, what's the effect on the potential energy surfaces given by, sorry. Um, given by the strong coupling. So here I've uh, reported the torsional coordinate for the bare molecule. We have uh, an Hamiltonian which consists of three terms. One is electronic or molecular, more generally. One is the radiation, uh, the quantized, uh, the, the Hamiltonian for the quantized electromagnetic field, and one is the light matter interaction. So uh, the um, molecule can be computed at, a, at any level, but it has to be a light method, let's say, because uh, uh, if we want to do an on-the-fly dynamics on this, on this kind of system, we cannot afford a very computationally expensive method. That's why we, uh, we have done this with a semi-empirical, very well-parameterized uh, Hamiltonian for the molecule a form of CI wave function developed by Granucci and Persico. Here are the states of the molecule without any radiation. When we add the Hamiltonian for the quantized electromagnetic field, which is reported down there, it's an harmonic oscillator simply, the effect is to shift the bare molecular states and to double them, so we address to the uncoupled state as, uh, uh, with two indexes. One is for the electronic part, and one is the photon occupation number. These are the uncoupled states. And when we introduce uh, the coupling uh, between light and matter, this coherent coupling, uh, we, we obtain the polaritons or the polaritonic states. We use uh, the light matter interaction in the strong coupling regime Hamiltonian. Usually, it is uh, modeled by a James Cummings, James Cummings model, but we have performed a lot of uh, trials, let's say, with different kind of coupling Hamiltonians, and we have opted for an extended version of the James Cummings, which address also the counter-rotating terms. So, just as two words about the splitting, it is dependent on the intensity of the field, which is characterized by the G constant, and the transition dipole moment between the bare molecular states. So this tells us that uh, the splitting we can achieve with the same intensity of the field is very dependent on the molecular geometry, because the transition dipole is different, of course, for uh, different coordinates. So we can try to scout, let's say, how can we split the, um, uh, the potential energy surfaces with this kind of effect, uh, just uh, trying to figure out where the transition dipole is uh, higher, what can we achieve, and uh, when it's lower, what can we achieve, actually, on the photochemistry. So, here is, are the potential energy surfaces computed, and uh, these ones uh, are the polaritonic ones. Uh, okay, these states uh, actually keep the same label because they're not so different in network. They account for the lamp shift, but the shape, let's say, is not so modified. While the two fundamental we focus on in this work are the middle ones, the upper polariton, indicated by plus and the lower polariton by minus, which are approximately uh, a linear combination of the two uncoupled states, simply. Okay. So, to study photochemistry, 
we have, uh, as I said, uh, uh, we want to have a light uh, method, and it is uh, direct trajectory surface hopping. Surface hopping method uh, tend to mimic uh, the wave packet motion on the potential energy surfaces by um, using a swarm of classical trajectories. They have a lot of corrections because uh, we need to take into account the coherence effects, compute correctly the hopping probability between the, the surfaces, and in particular in this case, we had to correct the usual hopping probability for the new coupling we introduced, and we had to implement the analytical gradients for the contribution of the strong coupling. So the thing we do is to sample on the ground state a swarm of trajectory, 300 more or less, and uh, we run a dynamics uh, and with a, under a, a, Boltzmann, a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution at room temperature, we perform a vertical excitation to the upper polariton that in this region in particular it's almost completely excited state zero in nature, so it's legit to perform the vertical excitation as we would do with normal absorption. And then uh, when the trajectories approach the strong coupling region, which is indicated by the black triangle, it's, they split and they evolve independently. So the, um, we have two kind of couplings. One is the strong coupling, uh, which uh, makes the, the trajectories up, and one is the usual conical intersection addressed with uh, the non adiabatic couplings between the electronic states. So, I will show you briefly a movie in a short moment where I, shortly, uh, where I have, uh, let's say, uh, where I simulate. The, uh, complete dynamics in, the, in this scheme I've presented. We will have the potential energy surfaces uh, the, seen from above, the upper one, the upper polariton, the lower polari polariton, and the ground state zero. As I've said, uh, we start uh, the dynamics on the upper polariton, and we will see that uh, the, um, the trajectories start uh, bumping between the upper and lower polariton due to the coupling. And then they evolve independently as they would do in a normal uh, uh, non-adiabatic dynamics. So, uh, here we are. as you can see, these kind of oscillations occur between the upper polariton and the lower polariton. I've chosen a 1.8 electron volt energy with a coupling which is uh, five atomic units actually. So we see that uh, we have a coherent oscillation in the first uh, 200 femtoseconds and then when the trajectories find another way to move uh, from this strongly coupled region that is going toward the conical intersection, the oscillations are dumped and the um, ground state population starts to increase. The thing we have achieved, I of course I've done many dynamics, but uh, is, uh, the focus is that uh, I've reported the um, bare isomerization uh, quantum yield, and the thing we obtain uh, by coupling uh, two potential energy surfaces is to quench the reaction. In this case, uh, we almost half it for uh, this coupling, and uh, we almost get it to a null yield uh, with a coupling which is thrice that. But that's a, a particular uh, feature of the coupling um, we have chosen. Because uh, in this case, uh, I've reported the potential energy surfaces with a 2.4 electron volt energy. The thing we obtain is, is that we don't have uh, any let's say, uh, coherent exchange uh, between the, of trajectories between the potential energy surfaces, but the dynamics is more or less, uh, let's say, the normal one. And indeed, the, um, the quantum yields 
tend to approach the, the quantum yields of the photoisomerization in vacuum. So in moving to the conclusion, we have implemented this uh, simple model and uh, implemented the analytical gradients to perform uh, a non-adiabatic dynamic on this kind of system. Then we have shown that, in, which is uh, one thing recognized uh, from the experimental point of view, that we can, in principle, modify the photochemistry through just a quantum effect. And also we have started to notice that the strong coupling triggers uh, non-trivial effect uh, just uh, by engineering the pass. It's very dependent on the pass shape. And the perspective, of course, uh, the point is, uh, we have quenched the reaction, okay, but can we, in a way, improve the quantum yield? Uh, we want to try it, of course, uh, but we need to involve uh, further degrees of freedom, which uh, are mostly, let's say, uh, toward uh, the exploration of the photoisomerization starting from upper states in the strong coupling regime. Then we need to include uh, explicitly an environment, uh, as was done uh, experimentally by Baumberg's group. Uh, we want to have the nanoparticle and the field which is well described, uh, and the cage which is treated uh, by QMMM interface. And then we want to investigate many molecule effects, if the strong coupling can trigger some kind of many molecule reaction. So with this, I wish to, you know, to thank again the organizers and then my group, in particular my supervisor, Professor Corny, Dr. Emanuele Coccia, and our collaborator by PISA. The fundings and you for your kind attention. Okay, time for questions. Short one. I have some rather technical question. Yeah. With this um, IM1 reparameterized method, this is some uh, set up just for this one, this one molecule, or it oh, is for something more general? It's for mostly the azo group, uh, the azo benzene groups and derivatives. So it's uh, not so general. It's yeah, yeah but it was, I was, this is already not just one molecule. This yeah, is the yeah, kind, no, it's the, 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 groups, the type yeah. of yeah. systems. Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much for the next talk. Uh, I mean, uh, I didn't fully understand how do you calculate it, uh, the, the electronic coupling? Yeah? Uh -huh. Okay, between, you mean between the polarity and the ground and the excited state? Uh, oh, uh, okay. So we have... Uh, um, wait, sorry. We have uh, two kinds of couplings. In particular, one is the usual non-adiabatic coupling. Um, for the, what concerns only the molecule, we oh, well, whatever. for what concerns only the molecule, we have uh, a lot of parameters uh, to engineer the potential energy surfaces to well describe the conical intersection and the interactions. But uh, uh, we use a semi-empirical Hamiltonian mostly. And uh, for what concerns uh, the ground state one, excited state zero coupling. Uh, we use a uh, um, type of uh, dipolar Hamiltonian, uh, light matter interaction in the dipolar coupling, let's say. So we have a uh, uh, transition dipole times the intensity of the field. And we need to have, uh, uh, to have this kind of strong coupling. We need to have uh, two different photon numbers between the states which are crossing. Otherwise, the coupling is null or well. It's not completely null, but uh, mm, it is neglectable because we have done a lot of uh, trials with minimal coupling vision and dipolar Hamiltonian and James Cummings one. And I think the paper will uh, be available soon on this kind of topic. Okay, so Thanks. thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. So let us thank our speaker and now... So...
The next, speaker, the next speaker is Andrea Pucci from the University of Pisa. We'll talk about polymer films with aggregation induced emission, a new tool for optical sensing and energy harvesting. So thank you very much. Thank you, Julien, for the presentation. And <clears throat> thank you for coming today. Sorry for my voice, but I just came out from a strong, over strong flu. So, but anyway, it's, it's OK now. Um, I would like to thank the organizer for the kind of invitation, Professor Barone, first of all, and uh, Monica for all their efforts and, and all, this, all, the, all the stuff and dreams. And uh, I would like to, to, to talk to you about today is the something more in the experimental eh? uh, science, more, 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 more news and, and results about uh, the, the, the modification of polymer matrix by adding some uh, additives, in, in, more in particular fluorophores, that are able to confer some uh, nice properties, new properties in the field of uh, optical sensor, optical indicators, and in the field of energy harvesting. And first of all, I would like to thank some collaborators from bachelor, master students, PhD, and, and postdocs but also my former boss, Professor Francesco Cerdelli, on the right up, Professor Fabio Bellina, the organic part of my, of my, my department, and Professor Barone for his uh, valuable contribution in the DREAMS uh, project, and uh, some of uh, my new collaborators in, in the Far East, in China and in, uh, in Japan, thanks for the synthesis of a very nice uh, uh, and beautiful uh, uh, molecules that I'll show you some examples, and the financial support provided by university, the European community, and the, uh, from Italy as well. Uh, so, everybody knows about the, the, the effect of concentration, for example, on the emission properties of fluorophores. Uh, some uh, fluorophore experience a strong uh, quenching of the emission due to the formation of aggregates, so the phenomenon is called aggregation cause quenching. Some fluorophores start to emit more light, uh, the emission is, uh, uh, is uh, higher if you increase their concentration due to the formation of very pretty emissive aggregates, uh, uh, J on H, so excimers and so on. But there is also um, a class of molecules, uh, new molecules that are called aggregation-induced emission fluorophores that are no emissive in the low viscosity regime or low concentration regime, but it starts to emit light uh, as soon as you add a non-solvent, a bad solvent, or as soon as you increase the viscosity of the solution. Yeah? This is phenomenon is called aggregation induced emission and was discovered by Professor Benzon Tang in China, Hong Kong. And you can see also some of his uh, beautiful video that you can collect in uh, surfing in internet. Uh, I hope it starts. Here you can see the difference between a typical aggregation cause quenching molecules. On the left is a perylene, and on the right, the typical aggregation induced emission fluorophores. As soon as a non solvent is added, the emission starts to occur. And this is well reported and well reviewed by Professor Benson Tang and collaborators group. And they attributed this kind of effect of a sort of restriction in intramolecular rotation or intramolecular vibration of molecules. So the molecules start to emit light as soon as they are in the aggregated uh, um, situation or as soon as the viscosity of the medium starts to, to, to increase so that the internal molecular rotation is, uh, is hampered at a certain extent. I don't want to bother uh, about the, the mechanism. You can, for example, uh, download some of these beautiful uh, examples, beautiful reviews in chemical reviews in uh, 2015. Yes, look at the huge number of papers devoted to this phenomenon, uh, well explained, but also the application is well reported from biomedical area to material science, to, from sensor to energy harvesting applications. And then on the second part, on the, on the right, you see a review in advanced materials, so something more focused in the application materials part. Uh, so what we, uh, what we did and what we are doing now, 
we are trying to um, uh, exploit the information, uh, the, the, the possibility of using uh, aggregation induced emission fluorophores in polymers. We have experience in uh, blending, in mixing, but also covalent linking uh, of uh, additives of fluorophores in general with polymer matrix in order to convert to the polymer some new properties from uh, stress strain uh, or temperature sensors or uh, vapochromic indicators, but also in the field of uh, energy harvesting in solar concentrators in particular, so I will, I will show you some examples. My presentation is divided in two parts. The first part is mainly focused on something that we did in the frame of the DREAMS project in collaboration with the Scuola Normale, with Professor Barone's group, uh, concerning the preparation of a, a polymer film that was able to detect the presence of volatile organic compounds uh, by means of an optical output. And on the right part, on the second part, I'll show you some more recent uh, results concerning the use of aggregation to emission fluorophores, uh, dispersed again in a polymer matrix, in a transparent uh, polymer matrix, uh, for the preparation of luminescent solar concentrators. So luminescent collectors that are uh, now one of the most important examples reported in literature, but also in most probably next year ENI will produce, will commercialize something similar in the field of uh, low cost photovoltaics. So, okay, we know, uh, starting from the first part, we know that as soon as um, a gas, a low molecular weight additive gets in contact with a polymer matrix and is able to interact with the polymer matrix, uh, polymer matrix starts plasticization. So it means that to decrease the glass transition temperature, decrease its viscosity. If you disperse a molecule that is sensitive to viscosity, you are able to detect the presence of the volatile organic compound eh, that is uh, getting in contact with the polymer matrix. So if you disperse uh, an aggregation inducing emission molecules within a polymer matrix, you know that it, certain polymer matrix has a glass transition temperature very close or uh, higher than uh, uh, room temperature. So it means that at room temperature, the molecule is uh, frozen within the polymer matrix. So it means that molecular motion are completely frozen and, they meet, and the molecule starts to emit light with a very high quantum yield thanks to the aggregation induced emission phenomenon. So, uh, without the presence of a volatile organic compounds that they start to get in contact with the polymer matrix, the polymer films start to emit light at very high quantum yield. So, uh, but what happens if a gas of a well interacting uh, molecule starts to enter the polymer matrix? So it starts to dissolve between, starts to solvate the aggregation inducing molecular, uh, inducing emission of fluorophore. And so the fluorescence starts decreasing because you allow uh, viscosity to decrease, so allow the molecular motion to be uh, more favorable, and so that the desactivation of the uh, uh, excited state um, goes through a non-radiative pathway. So the, the polymer film starts to decrease its emission according to the presence of volatile organic compounds. This is one of our first experiments that are published in the frame of DREAMS pro, uh, project. So we uh, develop, we prepare poly, poly, polymethyl metacrylate or polycarbonate films, so films, polymer films with a high Tg, with a Tg glass transition temperature of about 90, 100 uh, degrees Celsius, by embedding uh, this molecule. This molecule was a molecule donated by our co collaborators in Spain. And, uh, this is a, a typical aggregation induced emission molecules, a fluorescent molecular rotors. And you can see that the emission, sorry, but the pointer is not working here. The, this is the blue, the blue curve is the, and the blue color is the typical uh, color of the emission of the film without uh, the presence of chloroform. But as soon as you expose the, the film to the chloroform, uh, you see that the, the, the emission strongly decreases, okay? Uh, this is a drop of the, of the emission, and also a red shift because uh, the molecule is also solvatochromic dye. Okay, so uh, the film plasticization due to vapor exposure induces the fluorescent decreasing, 
uh, as a function of the time exposure, as a function of the concentration of the chloroform vapors. So if we plotted okay, the intensity variation as a function of the exposure time, we notice also that our film were also uh, selective to a certain class of, of a solvent, also in particular fiber combination of polarity index and fluoroagin parameter. So this is a typical parameter that tells you if a molecule is a, is a friend of your polymer, is if this molecule is able to dissolve the polymer, is well interacted with the, with, the, with the polymer. So for example, acetonitrile, but chloroform, dichloromethane, are able to well interact the polymer matrix, are able to plasticize the polymer matrix, and so that you see the fluorescence decreasing. On the other hand, conversely, hexane, toluene, THF, methanol are not able to interact with the polymer matrix, so the luminescence of the, of the films remain uh, uh, the same uh, as uh, the, the pristine material. Uh, the phenomenon is also reversible because it is based on secondary interaction. As soon as you remove the solvent, the solvent in the polymer matrix, you restore the initial luminescence. Uh, we are also now uh, working on two parameters. The first, the reversibility. This is reversible, the polymer. You can use and reuse again because it's based on secondary interaction. But also, we are working on sensitivity. Okay, can we uh, for example, develop a certain sensor, okay? Uh, early 2015, uh, the material starts to be uh, react at very large amount uh, of, of chloroform. Uh, this is uh, uh, 150 ppm is very high uh, concentration. But we are now working on the compatibility of the dye in the polymer matrix, but also in the covalent linking of the probe with the polymer matrix, and we are now, okay, we are below, below 50 in our laboratory around 20 ppm. We are also uh, trying to get in contact, to, to get intimate contact of the dye with the polymer matrix also. But we uh, discover also another result, that the fluorescence variation uh, plotted as a function of the ppm or chloroform vapors, the, the, the response is linear. So this is something very useful for a future application in the sensor field. Okay, uh, time is going fast, okay? But anyway, uh, the second application is in the field of luminescent solar concentrators. What is a luminescent solar concentrator? Uh, it's a slab uh, of a plastic, uh, polymethane metacrylate, polycarbonate in general, transparent plastic, transparent polymer, or a glass coated with a thin film of this polymer. And the polymer contains a fluorophore. A fluorophore is able to absorb light, to collect light, to collect, to harvest the sunlight, and to emit light in a special way. Emit light thanks to the total internal reflection, eh? total internal reflection, a physical uh, phenomenon. The fluorescence is concentrated and collected at the edge of the device. So at the edge of the device, you put a photovoltaic cell, and the photovoltaic cell is responsible to generate the electric current thanks to the emission concentrated at the edge of the device. This is one of the uh, most important solutions today in order to decrease the cost of photovoltaics because you reduce the amount of silicon needed for the photovoltaic process. And the collector here is able to harvest the sunlight and to concentrate the light to the edge of the, uh, of the device. So any kind of fluorophore Mix it with a properly mix it with a polymer matrix can be used. Uh, it's a preferential fluorophore that emits in the red portion of light because in a silicon photovoltaic base cell uh, show the highest conversion uh, from light to electricity. Low cost materials because PMMA is low, it's a cost effective material, low expensive material. Ability to trap also diffuse light and not only concentrated light, direct light, but that this material is able also to work under a cloudy day, for example, today. Eh? is able to absorb light and concentrate the emission at the edge of the device. Uh, you can see the effect also from a very uh, uh, daily applications. Eh? For example, here, this is uh, an improper way to use uh, luminescent solar concentrators, but anyway, you can see the light here concentrated. This is a PMMA panel, PMMA's lab, 
Uh, doped by cumarin, for example, is a commercially available dye. Uh, this is the fluorescence here is uh, uh, only for aesthetic reason, but you can see here the light that is able to concentrate this device. This is low cost device, okay? If you put here a fluorophore that is, gets in contact with the optical efficiency of photovoltaic cell, photovoltaic cell properly works thanks to the fluorescence emitted and concentrated here by this lamp. Okay, we, thanks to our collaboration with Professor Benson Tang, Professor Benson Tang provided his uh, typical aggregation induced emission fluorophore that is able to emit in the red portion of the electromagnetic uh, of light. Okay, we dissolve this, this molecule in a polymer, polymethylmethacrylate or polycarbonate, transparent, completely amorphous materials, okay, and uh, co by coating uh, an optically pure optical glass, uh, glass in, with a thickness of uh, about 25 microns. <clears throat> Thanks to our device and develop a setup and design in our laboratory, we were able to uh, calculate uh, the current and the, and the power produced by the photovoltaic cell, yes, I know, sorry, and by the luminescent solar concentrator. You see that this is the, the uh, only the photovoltaic cell, this is the photovoltaic cell connected to the luminescent solar concentrator. You see the increasing in the performances, okay? So we got new and, uh, results that confirms that the, uh, you, we can use aggregation-induced emission fluorophores for the preparation of uh, luminescent solar concentrators that are uh, can be also used for a uh, very practical application. So I hope to have convinced you about the potentiality of the use of aggregation-induced emission fluorophores in, due, in two different fields, for, the, for a sensor application and for uh, something that could be useful for introducing to distribute photovoltaics also in our buildings. And anyway, we would like to thank you and thank you again, Dreams or Project, that gave us opportunity to know each other. Okay, thank you very much. So we are a bit behind schedule, so if there is a very quick question. Yeah. Thank you. It's very nice. I didn't know your work. Uh, so I'm interested in polymer film, the yeah. wetting. Um, so I work on thin and relatively thick polymer yeah. film. So, so I was wondering if you have investigated for the chemical nose, let's say the first part of your talk, the effect of polymer film thickness yes. around the substrate. Yeah, 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 yeah. We investigated polymer, the, the, the thickness, because uh, uh, if you decrease the thickness, you increase the rapidity of the phenomenon. Yeah. Okay, you are right. So we were able to produce film also by spin coating yeah. with a, uh, one micron of thickness, maybe, maybe, maybe less. But if you want the reproducibility, you have to take attention, you have to pay attention that you, uh, you don't want to, to dissolve the polymer, mm -hmm. okay? So you have to maintain a certain thickness uh, without avoiding the complete the, the, the wet. Yes, you're right. So let's thank our speaker. And the last, the last speaker of this first session is uh, Deborah Berti from the University of Florence. We'll talk about nanoparticles meet biomandran, um, insights from experiments and simulations, and model lipid bilayer. Okay, thank you for the kind introduction. First of all, let me thank Professor Barone for the invitation and Monica for the kind assistance. And uh, at, at first, when I was invited, I was a bit uh, um, surprised, uh, beside being honored, because uh, I'm a full experimentalist, 100%, so I thought maybe I'm a bit off topic, and uh, it turns out it's not so, because also Andrea and some others uh, do some experiment, but my, my field is soft matter, so when the website of this conference was running, I read in the, in the it's not very, yeah. 
I read in the topics uh, that uh, one of the scopes of this uh, uh, workshop was to address the increasing complexity from small, medium sized molecular species to soft matter. So this is where I work, soft matter, which is basically equous dispersion of polymers, amplifiers, and nanoparticles or colloids. Therefore, I sort of felt I was belonging to, to this audience. And then I recall that a good friend of mine, uh, which is a soft matter physicist, Roberto Piazza, wrote this book for the large public. It's called Soft Matter, the Stuff That Dreams Are Made Of. And Dreams is also the name of, of the project. And uh, of course, this is a quotation from uh, uh, Shakespeare. It might be the stuff that dreams are made of, but it's also the stuff that uh, li life matter is made of. So in this field, soft matter, um, I will present you today some work that we have done in Florence about the biomembrane activity of nanoparticles. So first some definition, what do I mean by biomembrane activity? It is the tendency to modify yeah, or uh, uh, permeate uh, uh, natural membranes. Natural membranes in the simplest version can be thought of two uh, lipid layers uh, uh, arranged in a tail-to-tail -tail fashion, separating two aqueous compartments. Of course, we all know that lipid bilayers are the gateway to our cells, but also the gatekeepers, which allow passage of uh, nutrients uh, and drugs uh, and proteins and whatever. So by biomembrane activity of inorganic nanoparticles uh, or polymeric nanoparticles, uh, hybrid nanoparticles or also alphiphilic assembly, I, I, I mean their, their interaction with natural membranes. And why this is important? Uh, for two reasons mainly. First of all, uh, there's a big a lot of, uh, uh, would say, fast today about nanomedicine, so the use of nanoside objects to improve therapeutic efficiency. Uh, but still, I mean, we are very far from clinical translation. So uh, we, we believe that uh, the characterization with biological interface is key to understand and to optimize this uh, uh, field. And on the other side, for the very same reason, uh, it's very important when one deals with the toxicity. And to convince you about that, uh, I just report some figures from uh, a review uh, from Warren Chen uh, last year in Nature Review Materials. So these figures are the median uh, of uh, nanoparticles uh, which were delivered in tumors in in vivo studies. And you see that uh, these figures are very, very low, so clearly there is still something that we are missing. Uh, we are missing, uh, I mean, the we fully do not understand, I quote the paper, the obstacles that nanoparticles face when used in vivo. But obstacles means interaction and barrier in physical chemistry term. Of course, uh, uh, I'm a chemist, uh, like many of you, so I'm not able to, to deal with real cells, at least uh, not, not only with real cells. So we have to reduce the problem, uh, uh, let's say in an intermediate fashion, this is a reductionist, uh, say, scale from biology to physics. And we are just in the middle. I mean, we, we do not uh, uh, see cells like boxes, but uh, uh, let's say, something more complex. So let's introduce the ingredient of our um, uh, platform. So we, we, basically what we want to do, we want to uh, simulate uh, the bilayer of uh, cells, uh, the, the, which is the lipid architecture. So we make use mainly of freestanding lipid bilayers, so, so arranged in a carved structure, just imagine a shell, and the planar bilayer, solid supported mono uh, bilayer, sorry. And we will uh, disregard uh, for today the other systems. So concerning freestanding bilayers, uh, they can be formed in a relatively easy uh, way uh, by electroformation. And uh, this is a confocal microscopy image of such system. So we put some fluorescent dyes inside. And you can also see that we can induce lateral phase separation of dyes, meaning that we can induce region of liquid ordered and liquid disordered state in the, in the same membrane, which mimic, in a way, uh, lipid draft. Of course, uh, the, 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 the 
good part of this is that this bilayer are freestanding, therefore they're very flexible. And the sides in the giant version are more or less uh, the size of cells, but there are some uh, limitations which will become apparent uh, in a while. <coughs> Uh, so, in the first part of this talk, uh, or in the second, I should say, I will talk about a very simple and qualitative experiment that we did in collaboration with the Department of uh, Experimental Medicine in Florence, which is to compare what we see on uh, uh, giant vesicle and supported lipid bilayers uh, to what we see for real cells. Okay, so um, the, the ingredients are nanoparticles. Uh, we can produce nanoparticles with literature methods. We didn't invent anything, actually. But we can uh, very nicely uh, change uh, the shape from nanospheres, the first three entries from nanorods. We can change the charge, and we control their size, the colloidal stability, and the zeta potential, which is... Uh, uh, let's say the charge. So what we see, uh, well, for the for the say lipid part, we use giant vesicle, and this is a supported lipid bilayer seen from the above. It's the XY plane. For the cell part, we use macrophage, mammalian macrophage, which are uh, they are cells of our immune system. I mean, these were rats, but uh, are mammalian immune system, and uh, so they are very hungry. So they they eat chew everything uh, which is uh, around. And we, we use uh, a zwitter ionic lipid, and, uh, which is this one, and uh, the, uh, an ionic one. Uh, it is worth recalling that when I'm in a freestanding and in a uh, solid supported by layer, what changes, uh, if the composition is the same, is the bending rigidity. Because when uh, the coupling of the uh, lower leaflet with the solid support dramatically increases the bending modules, I mean, basically, the membrane is not able to bend. And we will see that this is also important. So very qualitatively, we can say that when I had to zwitter ionic target membranes and ionic nanoparticles, uh, I see that I have some uh, deviation from this spherical shape and also some clustering. Uh, you see that uh, we, we were in a very in much nicer situation. And this is a confocal microscopy image. Uh, here you can see the green from the lipid stain and the red is the gold scattering because uh, nano gold is also a, plum, uh, a plasmonic scattering peak while that one is the optical transmission. And you can see that in this region of adhesion, you have also colocalized uh, nanoparticle aggregation. We are in water, nanoparticles are perfectly stable. While if you look at uh, supported by layers from above, you see that the dye is very, let's say, uh, homogeneous, so the lipid dye, but still you have on the surface these gold aggregates, which are very, I mean, extensively uh, um, clustered, let's say, on the membrane surface, while in the rest of the solution I can't see any aggregate. And if you go to uh, rat macrophages, uh, you see that uh, uh, the picture is similar. This is fluorescence and this is uh, uh, TEM. Uh, you have uh, basically internalization in clusters and uh, collection on uh, the membranes. And uh, if you enlarge what is inside the cytoplasm, you see that you have uh, these large clusters here. But uh, uh, basically, there's no uh, disruption of, of, uh, of the cell. Uh, things change when you go to cationic stuff. It's very well known that cationic species are more toxic because of the charge contrast with the lipid membrane. So you start from these nice uh, rounded objects and you end up with uh, this burst, uh, which uh, uh, protrude, let's say, from an inner core where you have a mixed uh, lipid nanoparticles, huge cluster. You see the scale five microns. So the single nanoparticles is about 10 nanometers, just remember. Now, if you look at the supported by layers, no matter if you have a zwitter ionic target or an ionic one, you see that uh, uh, these nanoparticles are actually forming something like uh, you know, fractal structure uh, or aggregates uh, on, uh, on uh, the surface. And uh, this is an enlargement, this one here. 
Um, uh, so this means that uh, uh, we have a very extended uh, interaction and if we look now at what happens in cell, you see that you have around the, this um, well all these debris uh, which come from the membranes. So here the membranes is staying only. And also the TEM tells you that you have cellular debris all over the place. So what we think uh, is happening here is where the nanoparticle dots, that's, this is not in scale of course, uh, you have a rigidifying um, action of the, of the nanoparticles seen there in this uh, um, combination of uh, dyes. And uh, of course, uh, on the giant vesicle, you have something, you have the complete disruption of the vesicle, which is the same that happens on, on uh, cells. Uh, it's worth to say that if I take the, these very same particles and if I cover them with uh, uh, a peg ligand, or uh, if I put them in serum where they get coated with uh, seralbumin, for instance, so they are passivated, nothing of this uh, sort happens actually, meaning that uh, you have very surface active particles that can be uh, passivated by this so called protein corona, uh, which uh, you know, defines the biological identity of uh, the particles. If we now go to the cell viability, which was performed in this experiment, uh, in the Department of Experimental Medicine. Uh, um, meaning that the, the, the higher the, the bar, the more viable the cells, so you will see that uh, this membrane disruption that we have seen goes in parallel with uh, cell viability, I mean, uh, anti-parallel, okay, with cell viability, meaning where we see that the membrane is disrupted, uh, the cell die. So, I mean, the, the, the interaction with lipid bilayers, model bilayers, is a good indicator of this. So, now let's go a, a, a bit deeper on that. And, um, okay, skipping this nanoparticle, nanoparticles interaction terms in solution, which are very classically uh, taken from the ELVO theory, uh, we can define similarly an, an interaction term, uh, Van der Waals and electrostatic, between the nanoparticles and the membranes, and uh, where H is the thickness of the bilayer, R the radius of the particles, and D is the distance, is the variable, and similarly for the electrostatic term. And we can therefore uh, rationalize very intuitively the uh, interaction of the nanoparticles uh, with the membrane as driven by uh, charge mainly for the cationic uh, nanoparticles, while for uh, the Zwitter ionic one, it is the Van der Waals stents that drives uh, the aggregation. But more than that, you have a term which is the membrane um, elasticity, basically, which can be thought as composed only by bending uh, the bending uh, term uh, related to the bending modulus and the Gaussian modulus of the membrane. And remember that this changes whether you are in a free standing by layers and in a lipid supported by layer. All in all, uh, with a very simplified model, we can uh, define a critical radius for wrapping, which is the critical radius that the nanoparticle should have in order to be uh, covered by this lipid bilayer engulfed and eventually internalized, which is the balance between the membrane modulus of the membrane and these adhesion terms that derives from the two contribution in the previous uh, slide. So, I mean, meaning that for a rigid membrane, it takes a larger particles uh, to, to have uh, uh, wrapping. Now, if we want to go a bit more quantitative, um, we have to understand what happens uh, to uh, the membrane on a local scale. Therefore, we size down this big vesicle in liposomes, which is 100 nanometer, but basically we can think that the local environment is the same, and we went to do some uh, uh, small angle neutron scattering. Why neutron scattering? Because in principle, by changing the external composition of the medium uh, by a mixture of H2O and D2O, we can selectively match the contrast of one of the components, which is, uh, if you now uh, do the uh, experiment all in D2O for uh, 
some reason it's uh, uh, very long to explain. Usually one works in D2O for neutron scattering. Um, so we in start from liposomes and we add from the external uh, gold nanoparticles, the same that we have uh, citrate nanoparticles, and we see uh, the spectra are offset, by the way, so I mean that's really nothing to see. If we now match the gold nanoparticles increasing the H2O quantity, uh, I mean apart from the intensity, uh, but you see that nothing very exciting happens. But um, when we uh, looked at the sample, uh, when we really looked at the sample, we saw that uh, the dispersion went uh, from pink to blue, even like for uh, one particle per liposomes or four particles per liposomes. So this shift uh, towards the red that was responsible for the blue color is a, is a shift of the plasmon resonance which has been um, very well known and attributed to uh, nanoparticle, nanoparticle, uh, say, coupling, okay? And therefore there is also a plasmon ruler uh, uh, devised by El Sayed which can tell you how far the nanoparticles are to observe a given uh, uh, shift. It is an empirical equation. So uh, what is true is the membrane is recruiting nanoparticles because imagine one particle per liposome says still you can see uh, this plasmon shift in water. So the, um, let's do a partial summary at this stage. So we can say that synthetic bilayers can mimic nanoparticle cell membrane interaction and can give a hint to uh, nanotoxicity of what's happening. And uh, uh, it's the nanoparticle coating biology identity that, that uh, drives interaction, but also the membrane elastic properties because we have seen for a given lipid composition differences in bilayers supported or free. And then you have this adhesion, wrap and clustering effect. But the open question at this stage are the membrane induced aggregation of otherwise colloidally stable nanoparticles and then uh, this domain formation within the membrane which is uh, not very well uh, understood at this stage. Therefore, uh, what we did was to, um, let's say, um, drive more this uh, interaction. A actually, this was a paper done uh, before, uh, before the, this study, but let's go in reverse chronological order. So if we are in uh, a phosphate buffer, ionic strand, uh, so electrostatic screening, what we see, now the gold scattering is blue while the membrane is green, is what we had called crusting, because actually, the uh, uh, nanoparticles uh, uh, sort of cut a rise on the membrane and we are very far from complete coverage, very, very far. So it's kind of hot and if we do with confocal microscopy a 3D reconstruction here, really you see that the membrane is completely, let's say, decorated uh, to say the very least, okay? And uh, needless to say, you can skip this, if you have a protein corona around the nanoparticles, this effect does not uh, occur, or also very, all of very minor effects uh, can be seen here, some protrusion. Now I, I just uh, um, um, explain a bit the, uh, how much I have, because I guess my, eh? 10 minutes, okay. So uh, explain just a little, this technique because maybe it's not so common uh, like other one. Uh, so we studied this uh, process with fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. So the, 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 the instrument is a confocal microscope and this confocal volume that you see here is very thin. Uh, it's uh, 400 nanometers uh, in, this, in, this, uh, um, in this part, in, in, I mean in this XY plane. And uh, so what we do, if the uh, concentration of fluorophores is sufficiently low, uh, and we look at this confocal volume, uh, the fluctuation of uh, fluorescence intensity from the noise of this uh, uh, fluctuation intensity, we can reconstruct a correlation function, and this correlation function gives rise to the mode of uh, uh, fluorescence diffusion of the dye, whether it's 1D, 2D, or 3D, uh, to a decay time, which is uh, connected to the diffusion coefficient of the species, of course, but also to the intercept is uh, connected 
to the um, inverse of number density of the diffusion species. It's like the coherence area and the light scattering for those who are familiar. So, I mean, basically we, we can get three pieces of information from that, provided we have a fluorescent species which is diffusing in this very, very uh, tiny volume. Uh, so, let's say what we did, remember that uh, uh, very large vesicles uh, covered with uh, crust. So we, we, we did, uh, without gold nanoparticles, we put a dye outside, wait for 20 minutes, and we see what happened inside, because con focal microscopy as a later resolution, I can decide where I measure the, the, the fluorescence correlation. So um, what, what turns out is that uh, uh, this is the dye inside, green, outside, and this is the dye out inside after a while. And of course, the intercept is inversely proportional to the number density. Therefore, I can say that more or less 10% of the dye has passed the membrane after a while. While if I normalize, I see that the decay rate is the same, meaning the size is the same. The dye has passed the, the, the gate uh, without any uh, effects. While if I put these gold nanoparticles in the same experiment, what I see is that, uh, wow, there is a huge uh, entrance uh, of the dye in the cell, not only, but the decay rate is so much higher, meaning that you have the risk of lipids uh, together with the dye and uh, with uh, the nanoparticles. So I can really see this effect, okay, there. And I can measure permeability and confirm this. Uh, so crusting comes with the extensive membrane poration. Now another experiment, let, let's go to a, a, a higher resolution. Okay, so think about uh, uh, this kind of vesicles in 3D. Now if it slides from the equator to the pole, so to speak, okay, and I can do this with confocal microscopy, very thin slides. I go to the pole, the, let's say North Pole, and then if I measure uh, fluctuation in the confocal volume, what I see is the 2D diffusion of the lipid on uh, this North Pole, okay? And uh, I can uh, really measure what's going on with the lipid. That's why I'm saying I'm going to a higher resolution. So what I see for the giant vesicle is a 2D diffusion with a decay rate which is uh, 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 very consistent with the lateral diffusion in a fluid phase, uh, okay, 10 micrometers square to the second, while if I uh, add now nanoparticles, I see that I have a splitting of of these modes, so to speak, which is one mode is diffusing as, as the free lipid, while another one has a lower diffusion coefficient, which is consistent with a gel with a stiffer phase there. Okay, now uh, we, we saw in the literature, this is a Chinese group, they did uh, um, uh, dissipative particle dynamics, and so they were simulating uh, um, some gold nanoparticles covered with a, uh, a tile, I guess. And uh, so they saw that you have uh, um, aggregation on the membrane, and then you have uh, uh, engulfment and internalization of particles as clusters or as single entity, depending on, depending on the site. Or we are very far from uh, their size range. We never uh, looked at two, five, two nanometers particle, but still this effect is the same. And uh, remember that uh, in the supported lipid bilayer, we saw macroscopic phase separation, while for the giant vesicle, we don't see uh, anything. So with a collaboration with uh, the group of Pino Milano, in Salerno now is in Japan, and uh, during the, the master thesis of uh, Tobias Pfeffer, so we were investigating uh, this uh, free-standard but planar bilayer, 5,000 lipid molecules, and uh, six cationic gold nanoparticles on there. So if, if you see that where the nanoparticles adhere to the membrane, uh, you have a concentration of, of, the, of, the, of the negative particle, meaning that, of course, there is a kind of a separation of the negative lipid there where the cationic particles adhere, while without particles, they are perfectly mixed. 
So what they also did was the number density uh, with and without nanoparticles of uh, the same bilayer. Uh, that there's not that much to see, I would say, apart from the fact that when the nanoparticle is added from one side, what you see is that the glycerol backbone of the lipid is much more, let's say, ordered. I know it's a qualitative term. And uh, this perturbation goes also to the uh, uh, inner uh, leaflet. Um, we kind of saw the same uh, effect uh, using X-ray reflectivity. Uh, X-ray reflectivity gives basically the same information, apart that you don't have a number density but an electronic density profile, but on the same axis. Uh, we had some problem uh, because of sample damage, which is extensive with uh, synchrotron X-rays. Uh, and. Uh, to model, let's say, the critical angle uh, there. So I'm not going to show the Fourier inversion of this, uh, of this uh, curve, which will be the electronic density profile. But for now, it's a fist to say that a shift towards uh, uh, lower uh, Q, let's say, is indicative of a stiffening because the bilayer gets uh, uh, thinner. The last part. Four minutes. Okay, the last part is that uh, uh, what they did also during this simulation, and I know that uh, I'm walking on thin ice, they don't like me to show this uh, slide, I know, but they sort of measured the trajectories uh, of uh, uh, lipids uh, to, to get a, an estimated void diffusion coefficient. Don't look at the numbers because, of course, these are bits and not single atoms, uh, but what they saw on this uh, uh, bilayer is that when you have uh, uh, nanoparticles, uh, the distribution of diffusion coefficient, very poorly dispersed, is shifted to lower diffusion coefficient. And they are averaging a, a, a huge number of lipids and the inner and the outer leaflet. So therefore, I guess that uh, we are on the, same, uh, on the same side. So how to prove now that uh, we really have a stiffening, a global stiffening of the uh, lipid particles? For this, I will very uh, skip uh, some slides, but we did this with microfluidics, just building microfluidic traps uh, in, a, in, a, in a Y junction as there, so you can see the vesicle trapped in this uh, kind of uh, um, forest uh, of uh, trap there. So we thought that if we uh, uh, increase uh, the hydrostatic pressure in, in this channel, you see the vesicle deform, and then it's uh, released all of, a, all of a sudden, okay? So we thought that uh, uh, this was a bit serendipity, I should say. If we now measure this release pressure as a function of uh, uh, the diameter for traps of several sides, we sort of get an idea of how the vesicle can be deformed under, under flow. And so at first we were a bit disappointed, but then the polydispersity of the goof came to our mind. So of course it doesn't, at, and to do, the traps are very monodispersed. So if we normalize for a sort of, uh, say, difference diameter goof trap, we can get, it's not a master curve, but it's something that can be, uh, it's more decent, uh, I would say. So therefore, uh, we measure this uh, uh, for a series of system with and without uh, nanoparticles, you can see there. And we are now in the process of uh, tra translating uh, the hydrostatic pressure in a line tension, which has been done for a similar but, um, system, the macro pipette. And we can probably uh, get uh, the bending modulus and the um, expansion modulus. Yeah, I'm done. But uh, what is nice is even if we take in a very simple approach the release pressure, we see that uh, in the presence of uh, nanoparticles, the release pressure increases up to the value of a, a liquid ordered phase, which uh, it's done on single objects, on several single objects, but sort of tell you that we are on the right track uh, on this, on this, uh, on this part. So let me, this is the conclusive summer, summary. And uh, yeah, I missed the, the, the slide for the, um, for the thanks to my collaborator in Florence and uh, to uh, funding from the European Union, mainly from the Entecasa. And thank to you for your attention.
No, thank you. Are there some very short questions? Thank you, Adabra, for a very excellent presentation. Uh, just wondering um, about the behavior of the gold nanoparticles when uh, uh, approach at the, at, the, at the surface of a membrane. Is there also a change of the dielectric constant uh, around the, the, the particles, or the, the effect that you see is only due to aggregation and recruitment of the membrane? Um, Thank you. It, it, it's hard to answer. It's hard. Yeah, because uh, I tell you, for instance, in the cationic particles uh, uh, or nanorods where you have CTAB, that's the idea. The, uh, so it's now proven that the real toxicity is not the road, but it's CTAB that dissolves. So it also depends on how dynamic or how it's the exchange between the ligand of the particles and the lipids, which of course are amplified, so they have an affinity. I think it might be depend on case to case. Uh, considering that nanoparticles remain intact, um, it depends on the location of the membrane. Sometimes they say that the interface at dielectric constant close to that of ethanol. This has been done with molecular probes rather than water. So I think, yeah, for the external uh, part, yes. Okay, so, uh, le so let's thank our speaker and all our speakers for this uh, first session. So now the coffee break is at the same place as before. We have uh, a little change in uh, the scaled program because, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, Professor Barone is uh, busy, in, even today in uh, Saturday, and uh, therefore the uh, chair of uh, this session will be uh, Cristina Puzzolini. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, our first uh, speaker is uh, Professor Nino Russo, Università della Calabria. Uh, his talk uh, is uh, about the contribution of computational chemistry to chemo and photodynamic therapies. Thank you, Christina. Uh, good morning, and thanks also, Enzo, for inviting me. So today I will <coughs> give you a, a very fast overview of our work in these last decades in uh, searching uh, what is the best contribution that, uh, or contribution that theoretical and computational chemistry can, can give to the chemio or the photodynamic therapy. So, uh, the problem is, uh, is well known, and uh, the cancer, uh, people that have cancer are rapidly increasing year per year. Here are some data that uh, came from National Center of Ill Statistics. And uh, the, a lot of therapy uh, are uh, in development, and, uh, but actually, only few drugs are on the market. And uh, more important, only one of the mechanisms is known. Uh, there are other mechanisms and other drugs that work uh, against cancer, but the mechanisms are not still known. Uh, in general, there is a, uh, a correspondence between therapy and target, and uh, Okay, it's the surgery that has target this way, the radiotherapy. Chemiotherapy have DNA as target. And uh, there is photodynamic therapy that also have uh, as, a, <coughs> as target but, uh, the tissue, but have a, another mechanism. And uh, there are some promising uh, new uh, 
drugs that work on enzyme, protein, membranes, and so on. But in any case, the, uh, the drugs that are in the market can interact with this. Uh, the, the best known and most used is uh, drugs is just platinum. Millions of people per year use this drug. And uh, there are on the market that have uh, bypass adult uh, clinical tests, very few compounds that are essentially platinum compounds. Uh, the three uh, drugs approved in the world are other than just platinum, is oxaliplatinum and carboplatinum. Uh, there are some others that are in uh, advanced phase of testing, but until now, only one, the platinum, is, uh, was approved uh, in China and in Russia. Uh, but chemistry in these last year have uh, uh, proposed thousands and thousands of compounds that should be active in, uh, <coughs> in cancer therapy, especially in, uh, uh, in, in uh, the therapy that have as target DNA. But until now, only these three drugs are in the market. Uh, what is the first problem? The problem is that uh, Platinum chemotherapy is uh, have a, an, an ab initio problem. The medical protocol are completely empiric, uh, are uh, based uh, essentially on the weight and kidney function. And uh, some uh, and Drug toxicity and side effects are a major determinant in clinical environment. Uh, so current therapy is based on this. And uh, this kind of empirical protocol have uh, a, a, a very bad result because 40% of the patients receive a wrong dosage. This is uh, particularly uh, important because uh, platinum and other platinum uh, containing drug have a very high uh, side effect. So if, if you receive wrong doses, uh, you, you, have, you increase also the, the, <coughs> the cytotoxicity. Uh, there are some studies that uh, demonstrates that uh, uh, the future is a personalized, personalized uh, chemotherapy that at, at, at least should uh, give the, the good and precise uh, drug quantity. Uh, we, in, in general, with uh, the actual protocol, uh, only 15% per of the drug reach the target. So the, the, target, the final target is DNA. But before to, to reach the DNA, the platinum drugs can react with protein, with uh, especially sulfur-rich protein and other target, with enzyme and so on. The, The mechanism of uh, DNA platinum target is well known. The cis platinum is transformed in uh, down the cell uh, in uh, aqua complex, and aqua complex reach the DNA, and DNA can and, DN and can bind with DNA in a covalent manner and evite. Uh, uh, avoiding the duplication of DNA. Uh, this is really the only mechanism that is well known. So, this is some, some 
possibility to bring to, to DNA. But really, the cancer is more complicated. So there are other ways, other effects that uh, we uh, should explore in the near future. Uh, what is the contribution that theoretical and computational chemistry can give in this, uh, in this, in this field? But this platinum undergo an hydrolysis process. So we can study the hydrolysis. Uh, interact with DNA, we can study and simulate interaction with DNA. Uh, platinum can be reduced, and there are some re reduction mechanisms, and we can study also this. Interact with protein, especially with sulfur-rich protein, so we can simulate the reaction with uh, uh, sulfur-containing protein. Uh, we can also uh, study what is the best way to transport the platinum to the, to the target. Uh, more important, we can propose some new drugs. Okay, this is the, the, uh, one example of the, the pathway that undergo one of the uh, nedaplatinum. And uh, <coughs> it is a a simple but also complicated reaction, but we can uh, model this reaction and we can obtain some information on the reaction path. And uh, from uh, the, the information on the reaction path, we can have some uh, uh, information on the kinetics, because the kinetics is very important. In, in uh, platinum-containing therapy, the kinetic must be fast because increase the side effect and decrease the efficiency and must not to be too slow because have, uh, is, is not efficient. So if uh, <coughs> we are able to, to see what is the reaction behavior of the hydrolysis process, we can think about the possibility to modify the platinum in, uh, in a manner that give a, a, a a good kinetics. Good means that it's not so fast, it's not so slow. Oh, if, if we do <coughs> uh, this kind of work for the, for the drugs that are in the market, uh, in neutral or acid condition, uh, we discover that uh, <coughs> uh, the, the barriers for the kinetics of this uh, reaction uh, are about 22, 23 kilo K. So the different ligands can influence the uh, kinetics uh, with, in some case, with few kilo K. The, uh, it, it, it was proved that the, the first equation is the most important because the first equation is uh, the uh, give the complex that can interact better with DNA. So we can design new molecules that have some barriers in the equation process that can improve and respect the kinetics. The second, second process that we can study is the interaction of equated platinum inside the cell uh, with DNA. In, it can, the, uh, this platinum can interact with, uh, <coughs> with adenine or with guanine, but it seems that the preferred site is uh, the reaction with guanine. So we can simulate this, and, and we can see what is also the barrier for the kinetic and so, and consequently give some insight on the kinetic on the interaction with DNA. Uh, he has reported some barrier for uh, both uh, uh, adenine and guanosine. Uh, the barrier are lower with the guanosine. In, in, in these steps, more fast is the kinetic, is better 
uh, have a like better therapy consequence. Here are some pictures that demonstrate uh, this simple part. And also in this case, we can have a comparison between platination of different drugs that are in, in the market. So we can change, we can propose new drugs, uh, uh, changing the ligands of platinum too, and uh, uh, predict what is the uh, the reaction the, in the equation process and the, in DNA platinum. This is also important because many of the experimental study don't discriminate between the two reactions. So the, if you see the, lit, the experimental literature in, in some, <coughs> in, in many works, is right that we are not able to discriminate if the barrier is due to the equation or not or in, in, in some case, uh, have wrong indication. So in, uh, in our experience, uh, the, the barrier is essentially dictated by the equation process and not the platination process. So it's more important to design a drug that have uh, a, a, a typical equation process. Uh, recently, there is a, another strategy. Is, uh, uh, the strategy is based on platinum-4 compounds. And these have a big advantage because the platinum-4 uh, compounds uh, can be uh, used, orally used, without injection into blood. This is a, a, a big advantage because when you inject into blood cis platinum, cis platinum can react with protein on, on the blood. In this case, we avoid this uh, first side effect and uh, we go directly into stomach. So <coughs> the, the working mechanism of platinum 4 is, is simple because we start with uh, platinum 4 and uh, through a reduction in the, in the stomach on inside the cell, we obtain the platinum-2, but now platinum-2 uh, uh, is more close to the target, so the side effects are reduced. Uh, in generally, the these ligands undergo uh, in the reduction. These ligands are uh, uh, pulled out. The equatorial ligand, the axial ligand. Sorry. So we can try uh, uh, some computation on this uh, on this uh, <coughs> system. Uh, we have studied uh, acid hydrolysis, the neutral hydrolysis. Just and there are some uh, interesting conclusion. Uh, the main, from a chemical point of view, is that the uh, acid environment influences the rate of the axial ligand hydrolysis. So this is an indication for future uh, uh, <coughs> future design of uh, this kind of molecule. Uh, another possibility is to change metal. Platinum is toxic, have a lot of side effects. We can work on, uh, uh, on complex with, with different metals. Uh, for example, ruthenium or rhodium or iridium. Uh, from uh, from many, many studies on toxicity of this metal, it seems that iridium is less toxic than uh, platinum. So the complex with, it, with iridium are promising complex for cancer therapy. Uh, we have studied one of these proposed in literature, and uh, the, 
indication from experiment was partially, partially uh, assessed. Uh, we have seen in this case that it is very important the ligand in the hydration process. There are some, some process for hydrolysis that depend from the ligands. And uh, uh, also, w we have studied in, in this case also the, the interaction with some of the uh, systems that are uh, around the cell. So, these are assume uh, all the reactions that we have treated. Uh, first of all, with the glutathione, that is the, uh, the model for the pro sulfur rich protein. So you can see the hydrolysis reaction, hydrolysis product using NHDH, interaction with GSA, and the production of ROS. The potential energy surface that we have computed for the different system, also the interaction with guanine, in case we change the chlorine with uh, pyridine. With GSA. At Willen Edge. <coughs> Conclusion. We have seen that the process that make different the behavior of the two complexes, the interaction with glutathione is very important, this kind of interaction. Uh, both complex with chlorine or with another substituent ligand undergo hydrolysis and uh, can uh, coordinate with DNA. And uh, the interaction with uh, NADH occurs preferentially with the uh, aqua complex. Um. Okay. But platinum four products have another another advantage. Uh, we have the two ligands that are expelled after the reduction. Can we use this two ligand as a, as target uh, as a compound for the other kind of uh, reaction? Uh, this is yes. The last one is yes because uh, the the ligand that are after reduction can react with enzyme and other target. Uh, there are some of the uh, indications that came from uh, cellular drug update and DNA platination uh, with these different, uh, uh, <coughs> different compounds. Uh, we have the platinum-4, the reduction, uh, this platinum, this platinum activate is a dual action activate the DNA, the DNA binding, but the ligand can uh, interact with PC synthetase and uh, can uh, interact with COX enzyme that reduce the oxidative stress. In particular, aspirin, if you put the salicylic acid as a ligand, you have a, a lot of uh, news with respect to possible activity. So there are some, some cytotoxic experiment and uh, was demonstrated that the aspirin transported by platinum uh, four uh, is more active that uh, platinum cis plus aspirin. 
So this means that uh, platinum six released the aspirin in a, in a, an important step without losing during the transport. And <coughs> we have uh, we are studying the interaction with uh, with the, the COX one and COX two enzyme uh, to see if uh, uh, aspirin salicylic acid have the same property of the normal uh, and, uh, and potent inhibitor of this kind of enzyme, because this can explain why this second effect is important in cancer therapy. In particular, other than COX, this, uh, uh, there is uh, a, a series of enzymes like histone deacetylase that are involved in cancer therapy. So the, uh, if we uh, have with platinum-4 a ligand then can, that can act as a inhibitor of this enzyme, we increase the possibility to have, uh, <coughs> have more action for this drug. There are a, a, a series of, uh, of uh, enzymes of this family that are active and uh, essentially we have to inhibit the deacetylation that this enzyme dictates. These are the model for, uh, for the work that we are doing in uh, So, uh, the interaction with enzyme is a, another possibility to have a new target for cancer therapy. And we can simulate with computational chemistry what is the best way to uh, design inhibitors that can act uh, in, this, uh, in this process. The second part of the talk is the so-called photodynamic therapy. This and another therapy that is used in, uh, in solid tumors, but also in other diseases, and uh, practically uh, substitute the, the scalpel, because use not a, a, a steel scalpel, but use a, a chemical scalpel, that is the singlet oxygen. So from this point of view, it's is interesting for, for chemistry. This is a, a drug that demonstrates that we can substitute singlet oxygen uh, with uh, steel scalpel. This is a little bit an history of uh, photodynamic therapy that is a very old uh, medical practice that starts from uh, uh, Egyptian culture. There are some, he has listed some of the compounds that are used in medical protocol. In general, porphyry like compounds, but the research is intense in proposing new kind of. Uh, so the, the principle, the, he, here is a picture of the, the chamber in which the, the photo. Uh, therapy is, uh, is in act. This is a, a picture that demonstrates as uh, uh, treatment with this kind of uh, photosensitizer drastically reduces a, a solid tumor. Uh, the principle of photodynamic therapy is very simple. Uh, we have a photosensitizer, we use a photosensitizer and light with appropriate wavelengths uh, in order to produce uh, uh, radicals that are reactive and uh, can destroy the tissue in which are, uh, are anchored. Uh, from a photophysical point of view, we have to excite the photosensitizer in its uh, excited state. Uh, and uh, in order to produce uh, free radicals or uh, oxygen, singlet oxygen, uh, a, 
a transition between singlet and triplet is necessary. This means that uh, we, need, we need an intersystem crossing. And intersystem crossing uh, sh should be treated by relativistic uh, treatment. Uh, when we have the triplet, triplet can produce radical, or if uh, the energy of the triplet is higher than the energy need, uh, needed to oxygen to go from triplet to singlet state, can produce singlet oxygen. This is the preferred way in photodynamic therapy because it's more we have only singlet oxygen and we don't have a series of oxygenated radicals that are a little bit uncontrolled. Uh, we need uh, a light of appropriate wavelength that is called therapeutic windows. Uh, we need a single triplet energy of the photosensitizer that is higher than the energy required by the oxygen to excite the ground state. And we need an efficient intersystem spin crossing. So we, uh, from a theoretical point of view, we can predict very easily what is the wavelength of the proposed drug. We can predict what is the delta between ground state and first triplet state. And a little bit more difficult, we can predict the intersystem crossing. So some, some examples of uh, complex that are used. These are some simulated spectra that we have tried with a series of compounds. So we can treat a lot of number of compounds. We can simply plot what is the absorption and delta singlet triplet energy and have an idea what are the, 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 the systems that can work or cannot work with respect to these two requirements. We can see the effect of the metals. Uh, we can see the effect of the substituent in a core of molecules. These are body P that are uh, until investigation, modified body P. Uh, and we can also give indication on intersystem spin crossing. The system, uh, the <coughs> K of the inter System crossing uh, depend essentially by the spin orbit coupling and by uh, F, that is the density of state of the Risberg state. Uh, but this second part is also related to the difference between singlet and triplet energy. So, if we are able to compute the difference between singlet and triplet state, we have an indication. Um, <coughs> uh, we are working on this part with uh, Enzo and his collaborator to develop some protocol to, to compute this part. We can work with the braid power operator to compute the spin orbit coupling. And here are some examples of spin orbit coupling computed for a series of compounds. Uh, if you take as, as a reference the Foscan value, Foscan is the more used drugs in photodynamic therapy. And you, you can see what is the the best compounds that can give, just from a, a, a spin orbit coupling point of view, the, a better intersystem crossing. Here. So if you put in one figure the three 
parameter that you can compute with quantum chemistry, you have an idea what is the best system to propose for the for synthesis or for uh, uh, in vitro and in vivo complexes. There are what an example. We know why the spin orbit coupling increase uh, following the LSIED rule. Uh, we can give some indication also on the, the pathway, the deactivation pathway. For example, we can compute all the spin orbit coupling, uh, all the delta singlet triplet excitation, uh, and we can apply the Kasha rule to see what is the preferred uh, deactivation path. Of course, this is, is just an indication because in order to have uh, a more precise information on the deactivation path, we need to use the uh, uh, <coughs> CI method to compute the conical intersection and so on. But it's a good indication. And it's cheap from a computational point of view. Last part is, and I finish because I don't have more time, but just to give you an idea, is the possibility to have with one drug, two use, two, 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 two target. Uh, if we have a, a good photosensitizer, we can use uh, this as, uh, in, as photodynamic drugs. Uh, and we, if we anchor here a classical PD compound, we can use the same drug as chemiotherapy. So with one, one molecule, we can propose two kinds of action, uh, chemiotherapy and photodynamic therapy. This is one of the complex which we have studied. We have uh, fully understand what is the absorption, uh, compute uh, the spin orbit coupling. Uh, 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 we have give some indication on the activation path. Uh, and we have seen also that the presence of the photosensitizer part also a little bit affect the kinetic of the hydrolysis process. So we are working in this direction to have uh, some indication for possible new drugs that have tripler action now. So we, we can put on photosensitizer a platinum four with a ligand that can act as inhibitor of some enzyme. So with what one drug, we can propose the action as <coughs> chemiotherapy with DNA, chemiotherapy with uh, the enzyme, the target enzyme, and also use the same in solid tumor until uh, light irradiation. Uh, thanks to the group to my group and uh, to Enzo for invitation and you for attention and the uh, chairman for giving me a few minutes more. Thank you. So thank you, Nino. Um, there are any uh, very urgent questions <laughs> that cannot be postponed to lunchtime? Try to be Maybe it's not urgent, but very nice talk, very clear talk, also in terms of perspective. Very uh, doubt that I have about the equation uh, barriers, which seems to me a bit larger to be effective in uh, room temperature, like uh, more than 23, 24 EB. Uh, uh, the, the reference is uh, cis platinum. And cis platinum have a barrier that is about 22, 24 kilo K. This means that the reaction is slow, but not so much slow. If we decrease the barrier, we increase the reaction. And cis platinum with ligand that give a fast reaction start in the blood to quickly attack serum albumin and other compounds and, and increase the side effect. And it is strictly correlated to side effect. Any other questions? 
If not, uh, let's thank uh, Nino once again. We move to the next speaker, Tiziana Marino, I guess from the same group. The title of the talk is uh, From QM Cluster to QMMM Onion Simulation, the case of uh, uh, LIGW uh, the carbon silase. to be here and then in particular to uh, the professor Barone and also Monica that give me all the information in every moment. Um, the title of my presentation is uh, here reported and um, um, is uh, related to um, a most recent methodological study uh, that concern uh, um, lig W decarboxylase, that is uh, an uh, enzyme that degrades the lignin. Um, the, the organization of my presentation is put here. Um, uh, I will be discuss. Um, I will be discuss the results from the. Um, QM cluster model from uh, the two uh, um, models uh, um, based on onion scheme uh, of different sides. Uh, we'll be discussing also the results related to the use of uh, different functionals for uh, the performance of the, the energetic uh, um, pathway of the mechanism and the comparison with experimental theoretical data present in literature will be done. And uh, uh, together uh, we uh, can um, obtain uh, some uh, remarks about uh, the behavior observed. Uh, this contribution was to be an example how accurately Selecting the model of QM region, it is possible to have a detailed description at atomistic level of the chemistry involved in the reaction catalyzed by the enzyme and at the same time to corroborate, to validate, to uh, what obtained from the experimental counterpart. The presence of the metal ion uh, as uh, uh, in the examined enzyme can facilitate this, this uh, task because uh, the amino acid residues present in uh, its inner coordination shell create a scaffold around the metal that ensures and drives the selection of the residues in the active site to be included in the QEM portion where uh, uh, the chemistry of course for both uh, investigation used. Um, uh, we have uh, stimulated for uh, um, undertaking this study from the presence in literature of uh, uh, the, the um, uh, investigation, experimental investigation uh, before and then also a combined experimental uh, uh, theoretical study of uh, this kind of uh, enzyme that uh, um, can, uh, um, uh, could be interesting uh, um, uh, from uh, the bio biotechnology, uh, biotechnological point of view because uh, um, uh, this enzyme catalyzes uh, a very important uh, reaction uh, as uh, the decarboxylation. Um, uh, this enzyme is uh, um, a transition metal dependent and non oxidative enzyme presenting a manganese ion bound at the active site. It retains some amino acid residues of the EEH motif common to the other members of the family 
we, to which this enzyme belongs. In fact, uh, in, um, uh, around the manganese are, um, are present um, uh, the uh, histidine, the uh, aspartate and glutamate that uh, uh, are uh, common residues. Um, uh, the, um, here uh, are, is present uh, the uh, reaction catalyzed by this enzyme and it's possible to see as a, a five carboxy vanillate is transformed to vanillate by producing carbon dioxide. Um, the peculiarity of this enzyme consists also of uh, the uh, presence uh, of the active site in, uh, in the, um, uh, a particular location because it is uh, uh, located in, uh, at the interface between the two chains. So in the building up the, um, uh, the model was necessary to put inside the QM model, uh, amino acid residues um, arising from the two chain. Um, here are uh, uh, depicted uh, the model used for the QM region. Um, really, we uh, uh, extended uh, the, uh, the investigation, as above mentioned, by using uh, a gradual um, increasing of the size uh, by using uh, uh, onion procedure. So uh, we can look what happens uh, by increasing the, the size of the model on the energetic part of the reaction. Uh, all the calculations um, have been performed by using uh, Gaussian 09 uh, as version and uh, beetroot leap, uh, including the dispersion force, uh, are, um, is used as functional for all the optimization um, um, performed um, and, um, and then uh, an improvement of the energies uh, has been obtained uh, by using a, a larger uh, basis set. Um, in, uh, um, by go uh, going by, uh, from uh, QM to Onion 2, that is uh, the larger um, model that uh, I will discuss in uh, the, um, uh, I will discuss, um, um, uh, contains all the protein that uh, um, act, uh, that uh, is uh, um, an example um, of uh, um, the presence of explicit protein env environment around the uh, active site. Uh, the, the, the followed mechanism in our study is uh, depicted here and uh, is possible to, uh, to see as a, uh, an addition to double bond uh, occur by uh, aspartate uh, that uh, give the proton acting as a, uh, an acid, an acid uh, residue uh, to the double bond. So uh, the carbon in five position uh, becomes tetrahedral, then the reaction proceeds um, uh, for two possible mechanisms, but uh, the, the more accredited me mechanism is the first one uh, that um, uh, give rise to the production of carbon dioxide. Uh, we, in any case, we explored both this mechanism, but the second mechanism that uh, give rise to the production of bicarbonate is discarded from the energetical point of view. Um, the, the monitored parameters uh, uh, during a uh, theoretical uh, study of uh, an enzymatic reaction uh, is uh, the uh, barrier activation and uh, the um, uh, energy of reaction. 
um, it's possible uh, to see uh, by comparison of, of the values obtained in all three cases uh, showed, um, uh, it's possible to see uh, as uh, the agreement is uh, um, uh, more acceptable um, uh, in the case of the cluster model with the um, uh, larger uh, models used. Um, uh, in, uh, it's clear that the transition state uh, one uh, represent the rate determining step of uh, the reaction and this uh, result is uh, in agreement with uh, experimental uh, counterpart and uh, also uh, in, for the energy showed and uh, also for other theoretical uh, work present in literature. Um, also a good agreement uh, is obtained in the case of uh, the um, uh, reaction energy Although uh, the uh, intermediate model is not so good in, in reproducing uh, the, uh, the energy. I want to remark also that in the case of cluster model, uh, it was necessary to correct the energy um, uh, by taking into account a conversion factor that uh, um, uh, describes the um, transitional entropy due to the production of carbon dioxide. Uh, and this value is very common in literature for similar uh, enzymes. Um, uh, the pass obtained, uh, and uh, here de depicted uh, by using also uh, other functionals, uh, show, uh, show us uh, a very good agreement uh, in all, uh, um, a very good agreement in both uh, uh, cluster model because we uh, compared um, our results with that from Imo et al, that used um, a larger model because in our case we have a, a QEM portion that contains 128 items uh, that is uh, um, smaller than uh, that presented by Imo et al, but the energy is very similar. Um, in any case, the use of, of other functionals give, um, um, reproduce the, uh, the, the, the rate determining step of the reaction uh, and health of a little bit of difference uh, is present in the case of intermediate one. Uh, also in the case of uh, energy reaction, good results is, uh, are obtained. I skip the results related to intermediate onion model and I um, will go fastly to the last one. Uh, that propose again a good agreement uh, uh, taking into account all the factors above uh, mentioned, but uh, um, just for the uh, truller uh, functional, uh, we have uh, the, the value of the barrier for uh, related to the transition uh, state one and the transition uh, state two that are very closer to, um, between them, so it's not, so, uh, it's not possible to um, um, attribute the, the rate determining step for, uh, for this, uh, for this, uh, in, this, in this case. Um, uh, again, uh, the same functional uh, do, um, does not uh, reproduce the, um, uh, the, the reaction energy. And uh, this is probably due to the, um, uh, the presence of the water molecule in the, in the model used that um, interact with the amino acid present in the, um, uh, in the active site cavity considered. So um, uh, probably the interaction can give rise to the, this uh, different, uh, uh, different values. Um, also from the ge um, geometrical point of view, it's possible to, to see uh, as uh, the uh, agreement is, uh, is, um, is, very, is very good. Uh, Altof, in the case of uh, um, uh, cluster, it's possible to, uh, to, to look 
as a, a shorter value of the distance, of coordination distance around the metal ion is, uh, is found, um, while this not, not occur in the case of onium. This is uh, uh, the consequence of uh, the presence of the truncated uh, atoms, um, uh, as uh, usual in the cluster model, uh, that uh, uh, impose a constraint during optimization, but in the case of onium, this kind of uh, uh, behavior is not possible to find because the system is uh, more relaxed in, uh, uh, for uh, different uh, angstrom from the active side. Uh, also in the case of uh, the transition state, it's possible uh, to, to look at the, um, the, uh, the, the behavior, the, the very similar behavior, and uh, so also in the other case, uh, uh, the, um, uh, in other uh, transition state that uh, depict the, the cleavage of carbon-carbon bond for uh, the production of CO2. Um, uh, the, um, here also the, uh, the product, the final product of the, rea the reaction. Um, it's important uh, to, to have also um, uh, an idea uh, on, how, uh, on what occurs around the metal ion, because in this case, uh, we start from an hexacoordinated uh, um, manganese and we arrived to uh, pentacoordinated man manganese, but uh, in this case, the energetical aspect is, uh, is uh, still favored. Um, uh, by comparison uh, of uh, the theory uh, results with experimental uh, data uh, available, uh, in this case, uh, is available for another microorganism that present the same enzyme, um, uh, the, the situation is, uh, is clear. Um, uh, both cluster model uh, and onium ones uh, reproduce very well the, um, uh, the value of the barrier obtained by applying the transition state theory to the kinetic value available. Um, what, uh, what are the the conclusion, I don't have the real conclusion, but I want to remark that um, I, um, not exist a magic number to be considered for describing uh, the uh, chemistry of the enzyme. Because this, uh, uh, the, um, the chemistry of the enzyme depends uh, strictly uh, on the nature of the enzyme, on the presence of the metal and uh, other, uh, other structural uh, things. In any case, uh, um, if uh, you look this, uh, uh, this slide where I put uh, three different models used uh, with the values uh, related to the transition state one that represent the rate determining step of the reaction and the, na the, num the number of atoms present in every model, it's possible to uh, arise uh, the, the, the um, the perfect uh, agreement uh, between the, the model users. And I want to also underline that the, in the onium, I put the, all the protein environment uh, together with explicit water molecules. So I, um, I we described the um, very, very, uh, an, an environment very similar to the natural one. Uh, I want uh, perspective. Perspective for me are present in the nature, so in the structure of the enzyme, of the enzymes that uh, we want to investigate in the future. And uh, uh, I want just um, to thank uh, the um, PhD student Mario Preiano who contributed to this work, Professor Nino Russo. I want to remember my, uh, the research group of uh, PROMOX laboratory that uh, act in uh, University of Calabria. And uh, naturally, thank you all for your attention. Are there any quick questions?
If not, let's proceed to the next speaker because we are very late. Next speaker, so let's thank once again. Next speaker is Riccardo Kelly from the University of Florence. And the title of presentation is Binding Free Energy of Host Gas Systems by Non-Equilibrium or Chemical Simulation with Constrained Dynamics. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, this morning, I was very excited to know that uh, one of the, one of the most delicate the professor in the world was uh, my chairman, with all my respect for you, Christina. But uh, now I'm no more excited because uh, he decided to collapse his uh, wave function in a different place. Okay. Anyway, c'est la vie. Uh, let, me, let me talk about uh, my latest research, uh, which deals with the band calculation of binding free energies uh, of off gas system performed with uh, non equilibrium molecular dynamics uh, simulations uh, uh, in the, uh, using uh, the uh, alchemical uh, transformations. Uh, I want also to thank uh, uh, other people who, who contributed to, uh, to the research, uh, who are Eduardo Giovannelli, Matteo Cioni, Piero Procacci, Gianni Cardini, Marco Pagliai from the Department of Chemistry of the University of Florence, and Victor Volkov of the Nottingham, Nottingham and Trent uh, University of the United Kingdom. So, the results that I'm going to present here uh, are reported in two companion papers that are impressed on the Journal of Chemical Theory and Computation. And the first paper, uh, let, me, let me try if the, the, the pointer works. It works, but the, the, okay, okay. I, I will, okay, I will try without, without pointer. Uh, the, first, the first paper, um, uh, this with the, uh, in the first paper, we have uh, introduced the theoretical framework of non-equilibrium and chemical simulations with constrained dynamics. While in the second one, uh, we have uh, provided a numerical validation and the report in, a, in application. Supposed to have two molecules that uh, we can classify receptor and ligand. If uh, these two molecules in, uh, in solution can interact strongly or weakly, if, uh, if, if, they interact, if the interaction is strong enough, uh, um, the two molecules form a complex. The complex, uh, the, the type of uh, bond in this complex is a non-covalent bond. Uh, understanding uh, a non-covalent binding is, is uh, important in several fields, uh, including, I reported here, chemosensing, material design, and drug discovery. But other fields, uh, you can imagine other fields where it, it can be important to, to know how it works, non-covalent binding. So, uh, the most important information that we, we have to know for the complex, even more important than the structural properties, is the stability of the complex. Uh, the stability is quantified by the binding free energy. The binding free energy is nothing but that the free energy difference between uh, uh, products and reactants of this chemical equilibrium. Uh, if you want, you can also compute uh, the complexation constant from this uh, well-known relationship here, that one. Eh? There is one, only one equation. It's easy to understand what, what I mean. Uh, so, in alchemical transformations with constrained dynamics, the binding free energy is computed uh, through a thermodynamic cycle where there are three terms. One term is, of course, the binding free energy. The other two terms are the decoupling free energy. I go here to indicate, sorry. The decoupling free energy 
and the ligand solvation free energy. Uh, the, 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 the coupling free energy is the free energy difference between two states. One state, uh, on top on the, on the right, is the, the complex in solution. The other state is the uh, receptor in solution, that one, plus the ligand in gas phase. The other uh, contribution, the other term, is the ligand solvation free energy, is the uh, uh, free energy difference between the ligand uh, in solution and the ligand in gas phase. Uh, both terms are computed using alchemical transformations. Moreover, uh, the, the, the coupling free energy is, uh, is computed, to, to compute the, 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 the coupling free energy, we also to perform a mole um, equilibrium molecular dynamics simulations to uh, evaluate the probability density of finding the ligand in a given point, in a given uh, point uh, in the, of the binding side of the receptor. Uh, we are in, 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 in our, um, our target is the decoupling free energy because the decoupling free energy is computed using constrained dynamics. So the decoupling free energy is computed uh, through this relationship. This relationship uh, is the, the most important, uh, the basic outcome that we obtained in the first paper that, that I mentioned above. Uh, here there are three quantities uh, that we have to determine. Uh, the first is the probability density of observing the ligand uh, at the position uh, R once the complex is formed. Uh, I, I want to remark that, that R is a, an arbitrary position of the ligand uh, within the, the binding site, but it is fixed during the simulations. The, another quantity is the potential of mean force as a function of the ligand position with respect to the reference frame. And this potential of mean force is computed in the uh, uh, coupled state. This means that all potential energy is in place. The other potential of mean force is, this, is exactly the same, but it refers to the uncoupled state. This means that the ligand is uh, the uh, interaction potential energy between ligand and the rest of the system is, uh, is, uh, is zero. Okay, uh, how to compute? Uh, there, is an, uh, sorry, there is another term here, which is the standard volume, which is a known quantity. The, the, there is no calculation for, it's not need, needed any calculation for, for this quantity, of course. Uh, okay. How to determine the, these three quantities? The, the, um, the, the calculation is not independ independent. We uh, use non-equilibrium alchemical simulation to compute the difference between the, the two potentials of mean force, and we perform an equilibrium molecular dynamics simulation to compute uh, the, the probability density. Okay. In this slide, I report a schematic representation of the procedure, how uh, the procedure is, de is developed. Uh, first, uh, we, uh, we fix a reference frame uh, on the top, uh, le uh, top left, uh, uh, and uh, we uh, impose a constraint uh, to the ligand in green, uh, which is fixed during the simulations. Then, with the this constraint in place, we perform an equilibrium simulation where we, uh, uh, we, uh, we store the microstates of the system. And the microstates are reported here. This is one microstate, another, another, and so on. Okay? Uh, in this case, the, the ligand can only uh, rotate with respect to the reference frame. It cannot translate because it is fixed with a constraint. So, uh, starting from each uh, microstate, we do the alchemical path. Namely, we change, we switch off gradually the uh, interaction potential energy of the li between ligand and the rest of the system. At the end, we have the receptor in, uh, in solution 
and the ligand in gas phase, but constrained uh, to the receptor. What we need to compute during each alchemical path is the work performed on the system. And the work performed on the system is computed to this relationship. Here, U is the potential energy, uh, interaction potential energy between ligand and the rest of the system, and tau is the uh, duration of the alchemical path. Uh, once we have uh, computed the, the work, the set of works, we use this work in the Jarzinski equality to evaluate the, the oops, sorry, to evaluate the difference between the two potential of, of mean force. The Jarzinski equality is uh, like nothing but that an exponential average of the works. So uh, the same procedure can be used to compute the ligand solvation free energy. In this case, uh, we start uh, with the ligand in solution, in gas phase, but inside the simulation box. And uh, we switch on the interaction between ligand and solvent till arrive, till arrive to, the, to, the, to a situation, to a state where the ligand is in solution. We compute the work again, uh, we, and, and we use the Jarzinski equality to, to evaluate the uh, solvation free energy of the ligand. In this case, the dynamics is not constrained. This is a, the ligand is free to move and to rotate in the, in the simulation box. So let me uh, go to the numerical validation. Numerical validation has been obtained uh, by computing the binding free energy of uh, a complex of uh, zinc. Uh, and specifically uh, the complex with the hydroxypropan uh, amide. Three, three minutes, okay, I, I, I run. Uh, okay, uh, these are a uh, few informations uh, about the simulation. I want to stress only that we used 1,000 alchemical pets in the exponential average, in the Jarzinski equality, huh? in this case. Here, uh, we, ha we have calculated the uh, free energy, the binding free energy of two poses of the complex. And these are the two values that we obtain it. What is important for the um, uh, validation is the free energy difference uh, between the two poses. Uh, and the free energy difference, this one, is in very good agreement with, uh, with the analogous quantity computed with a very, very different uh, approach, which is, the, which is called path-linked domains method. In this method, uh, no alchemy is used. Then the fact that the two values are uh, almost, this, uh, almost coincident means that uh, the, the, the theory is solid and, the, and the, the method works. Okay, another, another application, an application that we have uh, then is uh, the calculation of the binding free energy of the of uh, beta cyclodextrin uh, complexes with aromatic compounds, specifically benzene and naphthalene. Also here I have reported the some informations about the simulations. Also here we have used the 1,000 chemical pads to compute the the, the the coupling free energy. Okay. Uh, how much time? One minute? One? One half. One half. Less now. <laughs> OK. Uh, here I have reported, the, uh, I have reported the, the, the coupling free energy the, the, in the, the salvation free energy as a function of the time of the alchemical paths. You can see that when the time increase, namely when uh, the alchemical paths as, as, uh, are slower, the, uh, the, coupling, the, the coupling free energy uh, converge to a value, to the real value, okay, to the correct value, compatibly with the force field, of course. Uh, the, I don't comment that the overestimation is not important in this context. Anyway, just to see you uh, the uh, binding free energy that we obtained for the uh, be uh, beta CD benzene complex, uh, 
uh, our results are uh, in very good agreement with, uh, with the experimental values. Uh, I remark that the energies are in kilojoule per mole. Then uh, our results are, are within the, the chemical accuracy of the, of the calculation. Uh, the same, the same uh, uh, result, the, the good result is also obtained with, uh, for the beta CD naphthalene complex. Also here, the difference between the, our estimate and the experimental values is, uh, is, very, is very low, is uh, smaller than one kilocalorie. These basically are, are the results. The conclusions, it works, the method, it works. This make feel me uh, very well because th this means that the theory is right. Anyway, uh, concerning the efficiency, just 10, ten seconds. Uh, concerning the, the efficiency, uh, uh, we cannot say much now because no deep test, uh, deep comparison with the equilibrium methods has been done till now. Then, this will be the, the future work for, for, for us. And uh, last thing, also, uh, I forgot to, to, to thank at the beginning the, uh, the um, organizing committee and Monica Sana for the, for the logistic organization. And uh, now I, who? Ah, you, for, for, for your attention. Okay. So thank you. Um, are there any quick questions? Just if there is a way to understand if when you have already done enough alchemical paths, because the, the, the number is always 1,000, maybe it should be yes, more for the cyclodextrin and less for the zinc, I don't know. This is a good question. Uh, there is not a receipt to decide how many uh, chemical paths are necessary to, to get convergence. Uh, 1,000 is, is uh, we, we have seen that 1,000 is a good uh, number to, to, to make the calculation. However, what I can suggest uh, when you do this type of calculation is to, uh, to make uh, a small number uh, of, uh, of, um, uh, of pets, but with different times, to see if, uh, uh, if you change time uh, you, you, uh, with a, a given number of uh, pets, you have convergence in time. If, this is, if, if the, the two estimates with different times is, uh, are consistent, are uh, agree, uh, the difference is low, then you can say that, that the number of pets is, uh, can, can be reasonable for the calculation. The, I can say this, but you have to, to do several trials. Yeah. Okay, let's thank our speaker once again. The last but not the least, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Maria Remers. Um, she uh, will speak about uh, can we accurately predict the mechanism of enzymatic reactions. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the organizers and Enzo, Monica, all the others for having invited me. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah. Sorry. It's okay, we'll take it. Oh, all right. Thank you. Um, and uh, so, um, so my talk was, um, I, I, I wrote down, can we actually predict mechanisms of enzymatic reactions? And um, uh, before I carry on, um, I mean, for this, we have to 
understand enzymes. And uh, I know this is a, um, a, um, uh, uh, some, a picture that you probably have seen many times, uh, but uh, there are still mistakes about it. Some people still make some mistakes about it. Uh, so if we have... No? It doesn't. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, right, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Uh, that was silly of me. Uh, so, anyway, if you, if you want to, uh, um, if you have a system that is not uh, carried out, a reaction that is not carried out by an enzyme, you can have, as you've seen many times, a picture like that with a certain barrier of activation. If we have an enzyme, then the barrier of activation will drop dramatically. But one thing that uh, a lot of people think is that uh, it drops and that's it, and the mechanism is the same. But often not, the mechanism changes as well, and it's not the same. Um, so, uh, one thing that, what, what can we help in understanding enzymes that uh, experimentally cannot be done? One is this sort of thing. The size of enzymes. A lot of people talk about the size of enzymes and, uh, and why are they so big when the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the reaction takes place in such a little place, the active center. And uh, computationally, you can really see that one, and I just mean one, of uh, the reasons uh, why the size of enzymes is as is, uh, is because of putting the active center together and not letting it move. And we can do this exp uh, computationally very easily by cutting the enzyme. Uh, so if you, oh, I was going to. Uh, so if you have a very big enzyme, this is just a, uh, this just a, uh, uh, an example, RNR, ribonucleotide reductase, uh, this is the active center here, and what we've done here is that we cut the enzyme and use very few atoms. So with 40 atoms, this is the uh, delta G of activation, uh, the yellow things, uh, uh, columns. Uh, and with 40 atoms, we get 17 kilocals per mole. With 160, 20. And with the whole enzyme, we still get 20. So this means that the system, the the enzyme is all there just because of that. How do we keep the active center together? But computationally, we just freeze the, the atoms, the outside atoms, and that's it. We don't let them move. And so this means that the size of enzymes has got something to do with that particular uh, uh, um, state of affairs. Obviously, it's not the only reason, but it's one of them and it's well established uh, uh, computationally. Another, another, and I'm just giving here some examples, as I said, to understand enzymes a little bit. Another uh, important uh, uh, thing that comes out of it, for example, is to understand the little tricks that enzymes perform uh, to manage to lower that barrier of activation and therefore uh, um, having these reactions that cannot take place in solution chemistry often uh, to really happen. One of them is this. There was a carboxylate shift mechanism proposed by Lipard in 1991. And this is really interesting thing. It, wasn't, uh, it was proposed qualitatively and, and found. It was not uh, uh, quantified as such. We did it in 2007 later on, but it's all his observation, obviously. And it's very interesting. If you've got an active center that has got a zinc in it, and you have a ligand approaching it, now zinc likes a particular coordination state and doesn't like to change it. So what it does is it lets the ligand approach, and if you look at the active center, more often than not, there exists either a glutamate, so this thing here, or an aspartate linked to the zinc with the two oxygens. And so when the ligand comes, comes up and zinc starts feeling its approach, then what happens is that one of the oxygens, the zinc oxygen 
bonds breaks and maintaining the coordination of the zinc. And this barrier of activation is very, very low. If you try this in solution chemistry, the barrier of activation is really, whoops, what did I do? Uh, is really uh, uh, high. Uh, we very recently, in 2013, because of this carboxylate shift mechanism, observed something that seemed to us about the same thing in um, enzymes with molybdenum. And it was about the same thing. So when the ligand came in, we realized that the molybdenum that always has, not always, but very often in, this, in, the, in a particular type of enzymes, uh, has either a, two cysteines, well, the other as well, but in this particular case here, two cysteines, or this X can also be a selenocysteine. So X can be a cysteine or a uh, selenocysteine. Cysteine. So when the ligand approaches, the same thing happens. A bond is broken and the molybdenum uh, coordination keeps, uh, is maintained. And again, the, uh, the barrier of activation is very low. Uh, and if you try this, this is so the sulfur shift, we called it the sulfur shift mechanism. And uh, if, you, if you try that in solution chemistry, the barrier of activation is very high. So enzymes are really amazing with these things. And the, we proposed it in 2013. We had a few experimentalists telling us that we were silly, but now uh, they are finding it. The, uh, the, um, the uh, X-ray uh, crystallographers and uh, spectroscopists are starting to find that it is so. so uh, uh, another little trick that enzymes use for this sort of thing. In PLP-dependent enzymes, for example, uh, something very clever happens as well. There are about 100 and odd uh, uh, PLP-dependent enzymes. PLP is this, uh, is this, uh, this molecule. And uh, these 100 and odd enzymes that depend on this PLP uh, perform all sorts of reactions, completely different reactions. And they manage to do so being very, very similar to each other. And the reason why they do that is because this PLP, when it breaks here in this particular, when that bond breaks here in this particular uh, place, the reaction is a transamination that the enzyme uh, gives rise to, that the enzyme catalyzes, is a transamination. If the breaking of the bond is that particular one there, then we have a decarboxylation. If uh, it's over there in C, sorry, you can see, I can't reach, uh, it's a racemization, we do uh, an alpha elimination. In E, a beta elimination. F, a gamma elimination. So this is really clever. I find it very clever that an enzyme, oh, I mean, it's not one, obviously, it's several, but they use these little tricks, these little things to lower the activation energy. And uh, rather than having a hundred and all the enzymes all very different from each other, they use all of them, the same uh, uh, sort of molecule, to further their own interest, so to speak. Um, if, still with the PLP-dependent enzymes, there's another thing that we notice which is quite interesting. I'm not going to bore you here with this, but uh, at a certain part of the mechanism that this uh, one uh, um, uh, um, catalyzes, we have an internal aldimine, which is this, uh, this uh, uh, species here, it's linked to the, uh, to the um, enzyme, so the other part is the enzyme. This is the substrate that is coming in. And what happens is that when the reaction takes place, we notice that we have three um, species very nearby that could help with the reaction. They were that tyrosine 369, cysteine 360, and the molecule of water. They were all very near this part, and we didn't know which one was going to do what, because all of them could help in that reaction. And then the reaction proceeded, and basically what we saw is that if 
we use, just focusing about those three species, if we use none of them and we did a direct pathway, so the direct reaction, we'd have too high a, a, a delta G of activation. 24.4 is not really acceptable most of the times for, and certainly not in this particular case because we knew the experimental value, which I can't remember what it was, but it was much lower than that. And, uh, and so that, that, that is wrong, but then we tried with all the others, and as you can see, 14.9, 20.4, and 12.6 are not too far from each other. That means that the enzyme could choose any of them. And my guess is that probably if we, or whoever the person, have one mutation in one of those uh, uh, amino acids, which didn't exist or was mutated by something else, probably the reaction would still take place using one of the others. And we have to realize that we all are different, our systems are different, and they have we have lots of mutations in our enzymes. And fortunately, very few of them give rise to really important or, I mean, nasty uh, illnesses. So probably what enzymes do, this is just my guess, I didn't ask any doctor or anybody, but probably from all my observations and the fact that I look around and I see so many amino acids that can still help in the reaction, probably what happens is that we have a mutation, but that mutation can be uh, uh, helped by another amino acid and the reaction still takes place and doesn't give rise to any terrible illness or something. So these are just interesting uh, things that we sort of observe. Now, if we often, we meaning uh, my group of research, uh, often don't look at the conformational space. We establish the mechanism of reaction without looking at the conformational space because we can do it without it, basically. Uh, but sometimes we do, just for the sake of it and to see whether we are right or wrong, uh, not looking at it, so to speak. And also there is quite a lot of controversy in the literature about looking or not into the, 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 the uh, conformational space uh, regarding mechanisms of reactions. And we did for this particular case of um, HIV-1 protease. And basically, this is the active center. I'm not quite sure why that uh, thing is blinking there. Uh, I can't remember why I did that. Probably was one of my students. I think it just shows that the active center is there. Uh, but anyway, uh, we can, what we did was we uh, looked at the conformational space and we are representing here all the residues that affect the activation energy more than 0.5 kilocals per mole. And the reason why we know that they do affect it is because we took them away and repeated everything else. So we repeated all the calculations for every single one of uh, those amino acids missing. So the positive residues are in blue, the negative in red, the neutral, and then we have the aspartate. The two aspartates, water and the substrate, are in this, and that's why the, the thing is blinking there. Anyway, uh, basically, what we can see here, which is often what people don't think, is that you see that the residues around the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, enzyme, i.e. on the outside of the, the amino acid, of uh, the enzyme, still contribute quite a bit for uh, the, the catalysis. And that's also quite interesting uh, to, to, to look at. So what I said beforehand, that the size of the enzymes was very important for the active center to keep it uh, together and all that, obviously in this case is not exactly like that. So we can't generalize, so to speak. Um, and yet another observation that I thought it was quite interesting uh, for this uh, 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 conformational space that we've been analyzing, uh, so to speak, in the, in the last few years, really, is uh, this particular one, 
uh, in which this is um, amylase, half uh, uh, alpha amylase, and this is the active center. And this is the uh, um, amino acid that is going to uh, attack uh, uh, that, uh, the, 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 the substrate. And basically what happens is that, or, or rather, nothing happens until that water molecule activates the enzyme. And that water molecule does not participate in the reaction afterwards. But what we realized is that nothing happens until that water molecule does something. And this is, the, so it switches the enzyme on and off uh, by coming into, coming together to the enzyme. And we only saw that uh, uh, analyzing the conformational space. So my guess is that you can establish a mechanism of a reaction without any problems, not really needing too much the conformational space, but if you want to know all the details about it, you really have to look into the conformational space. Um, so basically, we are in a case in which an enzyme um, has a very interesting uh, set of energy contributions, which is very large. You don't find everything like that in solution chemistry. Uh, um, I keep talking about solution chemistry because I'm a chemist, basically. Um, the, uh, 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 it has very long-range interactions, whether we like it or not, and some of them are extremely important for, uh, 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 for catalysis as well. Uh, this is what I presented you uh, in the uh, last uh, slide, uh, or, I mean, earlier on. Uh, in which we can just, with very few atoms, uh, determine the delta G of activation. But looking at this, at, sorry, looking at this uh, uh, here, it contradicts exactly what I told you before, because in this particular case, with the same number of atoms, oh, sorry, uh, uh, changing also, uh, the atoms, very few to the whole enzyme, we cannot guess the delta G of activation. Okay, so in this particular case, the long-range interactions are extremely important. So you can't generalize enzymes, uh, but we are in the presence of very abnormal PKAs at times. Uh, stable carbocations, which is unheard of in organic chemistry, uh, if, and very long-living radicals, and I'm talking about it from a, 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 an experimental point of view, not from a theoretical point of view or computational. So, um, um, they are also very flexible, and this affects the binding pose, the KM and the KCAT, uh, and they are also, the time scale of atomic motions is huge. It goes from the femtosecond to the hour. So, as computational people, we've got to deal with all this. We've got to understand all this. It's not so easy at, uh, at times. Uh, but what I wanted to get at was at the mechanisms of, uh, of enzymatic reactions, which have got to deal with this as well. So uh, when we establish a mechanism of a reaction, we basically find out how the reaction takes place. But what I would like to call the attention is that no other single experiment can produce alone a mechanism of a reaction. So spectroscopists do the spectroscopy, but they still need the, uh, um, the um, uh, 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 the X-ray crystallographers, and so do we. We need the X-ray crystallography to have a geometry. But in fact, we can model it, and I've done so. It's not very good. Uh, we're still not particularly well at modeling uh, enzymes. We don't get them completely right, that's for sure, but we can do it. Uh, and um, how successful are we at modeling mechanisms? Can we rely on what we turn up as computational chemists? Uh, can we predict or can we validate only? And my guess at the moment is that we are actually, or we begin to be, very successful. 
obviously there is an awful room for improvement, but we can validate and we can predict, which is very good, and in my opinion, it's a great uh, uh, advance, uh, advancement in the field. But there are many problems. There are many problems in knowing which Hamiltonian to use, for example. Uh, we don't know if the long-range interactions are terribly important or not. I mean, we know they are, but should we include them always or not? Because if we do, obviously we're complicating uh, uh, the, all the calculations. We, the reactional space is very unpredictable and uh, we don't exactly know what we're going to deal with when we're tackling uh, uh, a calculation regarding the mechanism of a reaction. The conformational space is also huge and we have to deal with it. And as I said, we don't actually have to deal with all of it but often we do if we want to know all the details as well. But do we know exactly how, about, how, how enzymes work? We do to a certain extent as well from the experimental part. We know which are the orders of magnitude of the enzymatic rates of reaction based on experiment. So we know that uh, we did a structural and computational study based on experiments, so we didn't do any, any, any computational calculations, or uh, computation, I mean any calculations. We just uh, uh, compiled all the experimental studies and then do the, did a few things as well. But, uh, and we came up with the fact, we realized that the average um, delta G of um, activation for all the uh, hydrolysis, in this particular case, is around 16.6 kilocals per mole. So we, do, we know that. Then we did it, we published this one. We haven't published the rest yet. Uh, but obviously we don't know which is the rate limiting step. We don't know all the, all the, the, the rest about uh, uh, the mechanism because uh, experimentally you can't do it. Uh, but then we thought that was interesting, and so we did it for all, this we haven't published yet, uh, but we did it for all the classes of enzymes. And you can see that everything is in between, say, more or less 15, 16, and on the other side, 19, 20 kilocals per mole. So what I mean to say with this is that if we do a, if we predict a mechanism of a reaction, we know exactly which number we can, we have to, well, I mean, we don't know exactly which number, but we know exactly the range in which our number has got to fit in. So if we, so it's quite easy for us to follow a reaction and say, okay, we've got two pathways, you know, I'm a chemist, I can realize all the chemical pathways that there are possible, and so if these two, if there are three, for example, and two of them have got a very high energy of activation, then they're wrong. And I know exactly which one uh, is the one to follow. So this is a big help as well. Um, so my point is, yes, we can predict mechanisms of reactions. And what I want to know at the end of it is something like this. I want, I want to be able to uh, do my calculations and then do a video and see exactly what's happening. And this helps an awful lot uh, with many things, with understanding enzymes and also something that I shan't talk about it here because I don't even have the time, but also to find out the uh, geometries of uh, all the transition states uh, because that helps us in drug discovery. And that's uh, uh, quite important for drug discovery. We have been uh, finding that. And um, I just wanted to show you that, uh, uh, and this is very quickly, and I just put three examples here. We have far more, not just us, the literature is full of them, um, that um, we uh, did a, a mechanism of asparaginase <coughs> 2. We published it. There was big controversy because we went against the experimentalists, but in the end, in, so this was in 2013, in the end, in 2016, the experimental evidence uh, came about. The same for, 
for example, in 2004 regarding TL disulfide exchange, and the experimental evidence turned up in 2006 in PNAS. The same, and I'm not going to carry on, this is the last one, uh, the same with uh, something that we published in 2003, and then the experimental evidence was published in 2004. So uh, there are many of these examples, so in fact, uh, uh, we can, that's my uh, conclusion, we can predict computational enzymatic catalysis enables a predictive detailed mechanistic port portrait of the catalytic activity of a given enzyme to be drawn, allowing a better understanding of how the enzyme works, which is what it is all about, to find out, understanding how enzymes work. Additionally, they allow us to design drugs that mimic the TS, and that is important, but that would be another talk. And furthermore, theoretical and computational methods are also a good complement to experimental techniques since they are capable of explaining many facts, experimental procedures are not yet able to measure, identify or give details. But also, I'd like to call the attention that the X-ray confirmation usually leads to the correct catalytic confirmation. That's our, uh, 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 our um, um, uh, got the mental block, uh, what we have in finding out <laughs> facts. Uh, so, therefore, single confirmation QMMM methods are still valid, continue to, need to be very valid alternative for this. However, many other techniques that explore more efficiently the conformational space of the enzyme during catalysis are being increasingly used we are, off, we are now using them as well, more often, providing a more dynamic picture into the analysis of the PES uh, associated to catalysis. And if anybody's interested in uh, seeing a little bit about it, we published something on it uh, not that long ago, well, this year. And I would like to uh, uh, thank my group of research, mainly uh, uh, Pedro Fernandes, my colleague, we've been working together for many years and having fun doing all these things. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Maria. Are there any questions? No, I mean, uh, just a comment. Do you think that uh, a long-range electron transfer or half reaction can be a valid mechanism within... Uh, About, uh, sorry. A, a long-range electron transfer, because you had a comment that uh, one of the problems is the role of long-range interaction, but what about uh, long-range electron transfer uh, processes? Well, that, ha that happens as well. Uh, and it's been, uh, it's been confirmed experimentally. And they can uh, go for as long as, I mean, the pathway that has been confirmed experimentally was 30-odd angstrom. Uh -huh. I can give you a paper on it. I mean, I can give you one of our papers and one of the experimental uh, people papers as well. Okay, yeah. thank uh, I am curious. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you very much for your talk. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? If not, let's thank Maria once thank again. You. And uh, it's time into for concluding the conference. Okay, the, the, the conclusion will be, of course, very short, and uh, then I let Christina make a final announcement, I think. Uh, uh, let me just uh, say a few words about... Uh, uh, the ESC project, because uh, uh, during the last five years, uh, uh, this project has involved, uh, apart from our group, the, the permanent staff, uh, uh, more than 20 postdoc positions will be fund, uh, have been funded by the project, uh, and uh, it has given rise to about 100 publications, in, which is a quite a good uh, result. Uh, for the investment by the European Union. It is a quite a huge amount of money from the, our point of view. It is around 2 million euros. 
but I think it has given rise also from a quantitative point of view to good results. But this is not the most important part the, in my view. In my view, the most important part has been the establishment of a further, col further collaboration, uh, some of which uh, are represented by people uh, sitting now in this room and having participated in the Congress around these three uh, days. Some of these collaboration were uh, already active during the years. Uh, the, the, the collaboration with Gaussian dates now about 20 years, I guess, something like that. Other are uh, more recent, uh, but I'm very happy of all of them. Uh, and the other uh, very important point from my point of view is uh, the number of young people uh, participating to these days and having uh, participated to the progress, to the, to the, um, the, pr um, the project, sorry. And uh, I guess that these uh, days and other occasions have been very useful for them uh, to know each other. Uh, and since the future is, is up to them, uh, uh, that's the most important point because I am at the end of my career so that uh, in these last years uh, what I can do together with a number of friends is to give access to young people to possibility of working, to developing new ideas, and uh, to change completely things with respect to what uh, we are thinking in the last years. Uh, I hope that uh, a number of uh, new things will uh, come out also thanks to this uh, kind uh, uh, of meeting. Uh, one of the, I, I, I must just quote one of them because it was at the end of uh, Maria uh, talk, uh, which is the um, passage from structure to dynamics and the uh, consideration that apart from equilibrium processes, uh, uh, fluctuation and uh, non-equilibrium aspects are very, very important, uh, which is from a fundamental point of view well known, from a practical point of view is much less known, and the development of uh, uh, reliable procedures for uh, taking these aspects into account together with other, uh, with other one, and to study rare phenomena, uh, rare events uh, is uh, of course very, very important. Uh, and it is not so well known in our community with respect to the community of physics. Uh, but I guess that at the same time, uh, our community is much more, pays much more attention to quantitative aspects in, in a place of qualitative aspects and on the details and how uh, small changements can give rise to very, very important processes with uh, a profound knowledge of the chemistry staying beyond all this kind of process. And that's, in my view, one of the reasons for having at the same time people doing very accurate uh, computation for small systems and trying to improve this accuracy to larger systems. And the people going from the other side having started to study in a semi-quantitative way a large system and complex system and trying to uh, make more quantitative pre uh, prediction of these systems. And uh, I guess that the richness of having different point of view and different approaches to complex problems is one of the most important things which must be uh, teached to young people. There is a... Uh, <laughs> Contrary to the belief of uh, my colleagues, uh, especially in this uh, school, uh, working on fundamental aspects of physics that are trying to find an unifi unified model of uh, whatever, I guess that the mixing of different models and different approaches is uh, at the heart of uh, the more important uh, research uh, we are doing and uh, younger people will do. If at the end they end up with an unified model, uh, I don't know. I'm not convinced of that. I think that we will be faced always with more complex systems requiring new points of view and the ingenuity of younger people. So that I let to them, it is not a testament. Huh? I'm still alive and I, I, <laughs> I want to work for a, for a number of years together with other administrative uh, aspects, but uh, 
I insist uh, think in a different way, try new ave avenues, uh, new frontiers, uh, new ways of mixing different approaches, different languages, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that uh, I end up with thanking all of you for being here, for uh, having contributed to this very interesting conference, and I hope we'll see you again, uh, perhaps in another uh, uh, context uh, for continuing our collaboration and our work. And uh, thank you for all of you. I will be very quick. If it works. <laughs> it's here. So uh, there will be a theme issue honoring Enzo. Uh, unfortunately, we got the uh, agreement for this theme issue too late for the uh, conference uh, in honor of uh, his uh, uh, 65th birthday. The uh, title is Challenging Spectroscopy, Accuracy versus Interpretation from Isolated Molecules to Condensed Phase. And this is what uh, they agreed. So the special issue will be devoted to the last, latest uh, research outcomes in the modeling of spectroscopic properties of chemical systems uh, spanning from isolated molecules to condensed phase with particular focus on accuracy and interpretative capabilities of uh, computational methodology. Particular emphasis uh, will also be given to the interplay of experiment and theory. The special issue will highlight the many contribution of Professor Vincenzo Barone to the field. The guest editor will be, uh, in addition to myself, Maria Ramos and uh, Maria Pilar. So thank you. I already thank them for joining me in this. And uh, with this, we can go to lunch. Thank you for your attention. And of course, stay tuned. Stay tuned because uh, you will uh, be contacted. <laughs> for contributing. Il titolo non era più fancy. Sì, adesso cambiamo. Da chi?